थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव प्रकाश प्लीज स्टार्ट इनफर्टिलिटी फॉर दिस uh talk we have invited dr sonal panchal i request dr harshit parasnis uh, to give welcome note as well as chair the session uh, dr harshit parasnis is president pogs he is consultant gynecologic oncologist from pune he is head of the department of gynec oncology unit uh, and associate professor from bharti vidyak medical college He is visiting gynecologic oncologist from Bijay Medical College and Sasun General Hospital. Uh, he is consultant gynecolo gynecological oncologist from Ruby Hospital, Wanavari, and he is past chairperson uh, oncology committee, Foxy, 2009 and 11. To accompanying him, I request Dr. Chaitanya Gunpale uh, to chair this session. Uh, he is clinical secretary, POGS. He is coordinator, West Zone. Foxy Endocrinology Committee he is director from Pearls Hospital. He is director of H I V F Center in Pune as well as in Satara and very good laparoscopic surgeon. I request Dr. Harshad sir to give welcome note and request both of you to chair this session. Thank you, Prakash. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone on behalf of Pune Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. i welcome you all again for our next webinar which is a webinar on ultrasound in infertility uh, this is another pogs connect with expert program we all we all accept that a good diagnosis and a proper evaluation forms the basis of any treatment good treatment and to explain ultrasonography in infertility who who else and better could we have than dr sonal panchal it is always a pleasure to hear you madam uh, a thorough academician and i, I think who has her her always says that it is actually uh, she makes the topics absolutely simple and easy for us all of us to understand uh, about dr sonal panchal she is a professor at the dubrovnik international university uh, a faculty at the ian donald school of ultrasound uh, um, with doing masters course at dubai she is the national academic director at the ian donald school of india she has done a lot of pioneering work especially in infertility and, and pco related ultrasound and has got a uh, numerous publications in national and international conferences and journals she's been an author in uh, several books and uh, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, present before you dr sonal panchal an the uh, expert for today's role of ultrasound in infertility uh, dr panchal you may please start thank you very much dr harshad for those very very kind words and uh, Uh, it is it is always a pleasure to be with uh, pune society it's i think it's it's full of all the friends i never feel i'm not at home when i'm talking to pune so today i'm going to talk on role of ultrasound in infertility truly speaking as you all know it's such a wide subject so dr harshad has been very kind to me telling me you can extend as much as you like but teach everything uh i know that if i i really go and discuss everything we are not going to finish it all but what we are going to do is we are going to pick up all the most interesting controversial topics and we are going to talk on that so that is about the pre treatment assessment and then about the monitoring we'll discuss everything <clears throat> so before deciding the line of treatment patient presenting 
with infertility, it is essential to eliminate the cause of infertility and other associated lesions of the reproductive system. This means it's essential to decide as to the patient is normal or otherwise. Even if there's an abnormality which does not affect fertility, still it's important to report about it because it may have a remote effect not on fertility but later on in the pregnancy outcome. So, <clears throat> That is to be diagnosed beforehand. This, of course, is done by ultrasound. And when I say ultrasound, we all know that when we are first going to scan the patient, we will all do a trans, a trans abdominal ultrasound to do a complete survey of the entire abdomen so that we don't miss anything in the pelvis also. And then we go to the pelvis for a, a transvaginal scan to assess the pelvis more in detail. Both are required because there is a if you are doing only a transvaginal scan. So what will we see on a transvaginal scan or what will we want to look for in ultrasound? We want to evaluate the uterus, of course, for its normalcy. We want to check and exclude any ovarian pathologies. We want to exclude any tubal pathologies. And of course, patency assessment is also important, though that is totally a different topic. It, would, it, it is a topic by itself and I've not included it here. <clears throat> and though we shall discuss, as I told you, though we, we will try to include everything, we will more concentrate on the, 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 the key points, you know, where all of us get confused as to what is this. Now, if you want to do that, it's very, very important that you do your scan systematically. Unfortunately, we all as gynecologists, uh, we are very, very particular about the obstetric scans that we do. There are special trainings on fetal medicine and we all are very, very sure as to this section for a bipedal diameter is right or wrong, this section for abdomen is right or wrong. But when it comes to the uterus, uh, I, I mean, it is like I've got a, I, I have won a lottery. So you just put in the probe into the vagina, through the intraitus, and then you move it here and there and okay, okay, I've got the uterus. It's not like getting the uterus. You have to actually locate the uterus correctly. And therefore it's very, very essential that we start looking at the screen. We start observing the, uh, the images as soon as the probe is at the introitus. And when the probe is at the introitus, that's when you are going to see the urethra, you're going to see the bladder, you're seeing anterior posterior vaginal wall, you're seeing the bowel, you are seeing the muscularis of the bowel, and you will see the interface between the bowel and the posterior wall of the vagina and the interface between the anterior wall of the vagina and the urethra. And these interfaces are important. Why? Because if you are going to uh, I mean, if you want to, to diagnose a deep endometriosis, this is the plane where you need to take a close look and find out any irregularities which would suggest deep uh, infiltrating endometriosis. So <clears throat> as you introduce the probe, I'll allow this to work now. So as you introduce the, the probe, then you will see that the layers are sliding over each other. You go and touch the cervix and then you are seeing both the lips of the cervix one by one. You're seeing the entire cervical canal and you are seeing the uterus in the mid sagittal section. So that tells you that the uterus is in the midline. And it's very important that when you do this, when you introduce the probe to locate the uterus, don't ever rotate or scroll across the probe. So don't, don't swipe the probe from one side to the other side because then you'll find the uterus, but you will not be alert as to what is the position of the uterus. And the position of the uterus is important because that will indirectly tell you there is an intrauterine or an extrauterine abnormality. For example, <clears throat> the uterus does not appear uh, uh, in a mid sagittal axis. It appears like twisted or rotated. There may be a fibroid, there may be asymmetrical adenomasis, or there may be adhesions outside or it is completely deviated. There may be a mass lesion on one of the sides of fibrosis, which is going. So it's very important to be alert about the uterine position. Once you have located the uterus, you know it is in the midline. The first thing you will do is you will 
swipe across the probe from one side to the other side in the same longitudinal plane without rotating the probe. And <clears throat> at all stages, you will observe the serosal contour, which should be smooth. You'll observe the myometrium, which should be <clears throat> absolutely homogeneous. An anterior and posterior myometrial, should, myometrial thickness should be symmetrical. And then you would go and always pay a sufficient attention on the endomyel junction, which usually we all miss. So that is a very important landmark. And, and uh, irregular and uh, intact endomyel junction is an important sign to tell us about the endometrial receptivity. So you have to look at the endom endomyel junction and then you would also see that the endometrium is nice and pure shaped and it is smooth and even the central line of the endometrium is smooth without any abnormal curvatures. So that's your longitudinal survey. Then you rotate your probe 90 degree and that rotation is always anti-clockwise. Why anti-clockwise is because when your probe is in this direction, when you are, it is, you are introducing it longitudinally, the markers of the probe are facing the roof, that is the interior aspect of the patient. And that corresponds to, I mean, I have uh, cropped this image, but there's always a logo there. So that corresponds with the logo. That means if the markers are anteriorly, this is anterior, that is posterior. When you are doing a longitudinal scan and <clears throat> when, you are do, when you rotate the probe 90 degree, the markers go on to the right side, anti-clockwise rotation. So the right side on the screen becomes right side of the patient, left side of the screen becomes left side of the patient. Therefore, side interpretation is much easier, much simpler, and therefore always rotate the probe 90 degree anti-clockwise. Now, when do you do, after you do that, so you're seeing the transverse section of the uterus, you will move the uterus up and down, rock the uterus up, and, uh, rock the probe up and down so that you can see the transverse section of, from the cervix to the fundus. That, that's the cervix, and now you're going to the fundus. So you'll see the entire fundus where you're seeing the porno, uh, uh, spreading across their uh, extent. So having done that, so you have surveyed the entire uterus on your transverse survey, also look at the serosa, myometrium, endomyel junction and the endometrium. And now you will move to the adenexa. How do you move to the adenexa? You have done the uterus, now you just move the probe laterally and okay, okay, I we finding the ovary, no, yes, no. And yes, 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 I've got it, no, that's not right again. You must always follow that soft tissue and nexal band. We know which consists of tube, ligaments, and vessels. And that is the, at the end of that is the ovary. So ovary always can be best located when you are, when you are tracing that soft tissue and nexal band. <clears throat> and once you've located the ovary, then you have to scroll across the entire ovary. One, then you rotate the probe and find out the longest axis of the ovary, find out the longest axis of the ovary and freeze that. Rotate your probe 90 degree and freeze another image on the dual screen. And that is your longitudinal and transverse images of the ovary. This, this, this clip, I particularly put here to show you that whenever you are counting the antral follicles, you must only scroll across if you rotate, as it is shown in the end of the clip, if you rotate it, you are going to count the same follicles over and over again. So this is rotation. So don't do that rotation. So it's very important that counting the enteral follicles should only be scrolling across, no rotation of the probe. So that's, that's about the ovarian survey. Having done that, ovarian survey, uterine survey, now, of course, you want to check for the mobility of the structures. You want to rule out any adhesions. So in and out movement of the probe, and you can beautifully see the, the, the bowel loops uh, sliding over the uterus from the cervix at the fundus everywhere. And you have to do the same for the ovary too. Even if there is an extra ovarian lesion, I mean, there's an adenaxal lesion, any adenaxal lesion, you, you have to put your probe so that you're seeing the ovary and the adenaxal lesion side by side. And then you do an in and out movement and you of the probe or if, if the ovary is too deep or if the structures are too, too deep and moving the probe does not move uh, the, the structure, then you have to press from the abdomen. The probe is in the vagina and go press it from the abdomen. 
to move the structures in relation to to allow the structures to slide over each other and that is that that is what uh, uh, confirms the mobility of the structure rules out addition so that's how you are going to do the entire survey now there is one more thing which you have to see when you are doing the survey of the uterus as i told you when you are doing a transverse survey you are going to move the probe and you are going to go into a section which is sort of a semi coronal section and when you when you go to that section you will see a a, a, a indent on the endometrial cavity on the endometrium and if you see that indent which means that there is a duplication abnormality which may be as mild as an arcuate uterus or it may be as severe as a bicornuate uterus but we know that a bicornuate uterus would usually also show an indent on the cortex that means right from your uh, uh, primary uh, observation of the 2d scan you will make out you will you will uh, uh, suspect a duplication abnormality you go on to the longitudinal scan and as i told you on the longitudinal scan we are going to observe the serosa myometrium and the uh, endomyo junction and endometrium but very important whenever you are scrolling across in the longitudinal section you must always observe the distance between the fundal end of the endometrium and the fundal end of the serosa if this distance is maximum in the center and as you move to the sides it decreases it feels like endometrium is trying to approach the serosa this is another sign that tells you there is a duplication abnormality again it may be as mild as arcuate it may be as severe as bicornuate but there is a duplication abnormality but we know that for all duplication abnormalities for all mullerian abnormalities the gold standard now is the 3d ultrasound why because we know that whatever classification system you are using whether it's afs which we used to uh, use for years 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 together starting from 2003 till 2013 and that used to classify the uterus into um, in, into unicornuate bicornuate diadelphous and so on septate and so on and the new system which has come since 2013 which is ashray sj classification system where we name the different classes as as a normal uterus a dysmorphic uterus a hemi uterus a bicorporeal uterus and septic uterus and so on whatever method you are using what is instrumental in in classifying is one the contour of the fundus serosal fundus and second the contour of the endometrial cavity and that too in the coronal section and both these can be seen in the coronal section on 3d and that is the greatest advantage of 3d it therefore demonstrates beautifully the uterine shape and therefore can detect the abnormalities very confidently a septum a septum a, a unicornuate a subseptum so it's it's very easy to diagnose and therefore 3d has become a modality of choice for the same there is a literature evidence also which says that transvaginal 3d ultrasound has proved to be extremely accurate for the detection of mullerian abnormalities and it seems to have replaced endoscopy as a gold standard technique for diagnosis i think that is a little exaggeration but yes it is it is so so accurate a method if i say that we are going to i mean if if we are using ashray as a classification i have purposefully put this classification instead of afs because not only afs is pretty old now but many of us might not be fully aware as to how to apply this uh, classification system and therefore uh, it is it is thought to be much more simpler much more practically oriented than the the older system why because where in the old system we used to uh, take some measurements Uh, and and this a particular measurement less than 5 mm or more than 10 mm leads i mean leads us to a diagnosis of a septate or a bicornuate and so on here i mean that was not valid because everywhere because some uteri may be small and some may be large and if i am measuring the distance uh, as 10 mm in a large uterus that 10 mm also might not be uh, might might i mean that may be a bicornuate and that 10 
more than 10 millimeter might still be a uh, sorry more than 10 millimeter might still be a bicornuate and less than 10 millimeter might still be a septate and, and so on so what this system does here is it uses the uterus's own myometrial wall thickness as a standard measurement so you draw an intracornual line and you would measure the distance from this line to the highest point on the fundus and that is x that x is taken as a standard measurement Okay, now we all know that when the endometrial cavity is flat or convex, it is normal. But even when it is concave, if the distance between this line to the deepest point there is less than 50% of this, it is still normal. So arcuate does not exist anymore. Arcuate is a normal uterus. The controversial diagnoses are one T-shaped uterus and a hypoplastic uterus. Just clearly mention only if the uterus cervical ratio is abnormal. It is a hypoplastic uterus and in all hypoplastic uteri, the lateral wall is not extraordinarily thick. Whereas you call T-shaped or T-shaped only when the lateral wall thickness is more. So the narrow cavity is because of the increased lateral wall thickness and that is a T-shaped uterus. And that thickness is more than 1.4 times the myometrial wall thickness draw a line from the cornu to the os, internal os, draw perpendicular on it from the deepest point on the endometrial cavity. And if you consider the line which is beyond uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the part of the perpendicular which is beyond that line, laterally, if that distance is more than 1.4, the myometrial wall thickness, it is T-shaped. So it's very clear definition, not all Narrow cavities are T-shaped cavities. Very important. Second, differentiation between septate and biconvert. We Biconvert is now bicorporeal. And any uterus that has two corpora is bicorporeal. The, if the corpora is single, corpus is single, that means it's a single body. If there is no notch on the fundus, it is a septum. No matter what is the angle, no matter what is the, the, the depth, no matter what is the thickness. This, that is a septum. So if there is a distortion of the endometrial contour of more than 50% of the myometrial wall, it is septum. But if there is distortion of the outer contour, fundal contour, more than 50% of the myometrial wall thickness, it is bicorporeal. So this is bicorporeal for sure, but even if that curvature would have been here like that, it is still a bicorporeal because it is still more than 50%, but less than that, shallower than that is a septum. So that again is quite simple and easy to understand. Now, when I say bicorporeal, if it extends up to the division extends up to the internal loss, it is complete bicorporeal less than that is partial bicorporeal. Now, there we used to confuse a bicornuate or a, a didelphus, it is very clear that if we have double cervix with that, it is it used to be a didelphus, but now we still call it a bicorporeal. The cervix shape is described separately. So that that confusion is gone. And if there are two separate cervices, you mention double normal cervix, and otherwise you say septated cervix. So that's how it goes. They are all bicorporeals. There used to be a huge, huge confusion when there used to be a notch there and still a thick septum like contour of the, of the endometrial cavity or of the uterus. If the distance from this notch, serosal notch to the notch, deepest point between the two endometrial cavities is 1.5 times X, only then it is, so and, and with a notch on the fundus, that means it is bicorporeal septate. That's a bicorporeal septic. So a confusion is given a name. So that is about the Mullerian uh, abnormality confusions. Now going to the acquired abnormalities. Adenomas is most common, most common diagnosis, I would say in the infertile population and quite underdiagnosed many a times. Any heterogeneity in the myometrium we all know is, is uh, likely to be adenomyces, is usually adenomyces, but this heterogeneity may be because of anechoic areas, the myometrial cyst, as you can see here also, maybe because of hyperechoic spots, hyperechoic lines, hyperechoic islands, as you can see here, some of them. And moreover, very typically, it gives 
alternate hyper hypoechoic vertical shadows which is called fen shadows there were different names given to this rain in forest appearance vanishing blind pattern and 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 um, a lot of other things but this this is now described un under the morphological um, sonographic uterus uterine assessment musa guidelines it's called fen shadows so these are all typical of adenomyces the myometrial cysts of adenomyces typically have hyperechoic margins and they also show vascularity around there is the irregularity or obliteration of the endomyo junction is very typical of adenomyces and probably one of the first signs because we know that the endometrium doesn't remain contained inside itself it breaks the endomyo junction and starts traversing or, or invading into the myometrium and that is at you know start of adenomyces and therefore irregularity of the endomyo junction is the first sign or obliteration of the endomyo junction because of hyperechoic bands or hypoechoic areas is what is the first sign of adenomyces apart from that people have also seen a typical question mark or ear shaped uterus and this is again because of asymmetrical involvement one of of one of the myometrial walls and second because of uh, the fact that adenomyces may be also associated with Uh, endometriosis and there may be adhesions which is leading to an abnormal uh, curvature very important when there is a cesarean scar this abnormal curvature even if it is there because of adhesion starts from here the uterus bands from here this bands from the mid body and that is what is differentiating so question mark uterus or a ear shaped uterus and of course when you look at the vascularity very important not all adenomyces are hypervascular but whatever vessels they have they are larger in diameter than the normal spiral vessels very important those adenomyotic lesions which are vascular they respond to medical line of treatment those are not will not respond to medical line of treatment we may have localized adenomyces also which we call adenomyoma and this is very difficult to differentiate from degenerated fibroids especially we know that fibroids otherwise are very easy to diagnose and uh, hypoechoic well defined round or oval masses but when it comes to a degenerated fibroid and we need to differentiate it from the adenomyoma remember that adenomyoma as you can compare here is though it's a localized lesion it's not a very sharp margin there here it's a very sharp margin the second important sign is as i've told you the endomyo junction it's always obliterated or uh, interrupted or 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 irregular in adenomyces it is just displaced in in fibroids the third important sign is fen shadows that we described in adenomyces is present in adenomyces but it's also present in fibroid but a prominent hypoechoic shadow at the end or at the margin of the fibroid which is called an edge shadow is only present in fibroid never in an adenomyoma and of course the vascular arrangement is always peripheral perif perif vascularity is always present in a fibroid in spite of the fact that a fibroid is degenerated and has internal vascularity the peripheral vascularity is still there and that tells me it is a fibroid very important the vessels in the adenomyces as you can see here they are traversing across the lesion they are called translational vessels whereas here you have internal vascularity but they are contained inside the capsule and the pseudo capsule and this are called intralesional vessels so that is the difference between the two now coming to the third confusion and that is an intraendometrial fibroid or a polyp again very important to fibroid and a polyp so how do you differentiate between the two again i'm going to just give you the practical tips fibroids are best seen in secretory phase because they are hypoechoic to the myometrium and that means they are hypoechoic to the secretory endometrium also they are quite isoechoic to the periovulatory endometrium whereas polyps are echogenic and best seen in the preovulatory phase 
Second, we all know the vascular pattern, single feeding vessel for the polyp and a, and, and a peripheral ring pattern for a fibroid. And of course, 3D is quite helpful. You can also do a sono hystero. What is helpful in 3D? If you have cut at the correct place, a TO fibroid, because its origin is from the, from the myometrium, it pulls in, it folds in the endomyo junction, as you can see here in the lower image. And that tells you it's a fibroid and not a polyp. For the polyp, the endomyo junction is always intact. Coming to Sinechi, Sinechi are suspected when you have a persistently thin, non-responding endometrium. I'll not even say thin. Sometimes it is, it appears like five, six millimeters, but it remains constant. Normal endometrium, normal follicle must always, always be dynamic. If it is not, if the endometrium is not dynamic, that's when you suspect a possibility of sinechi. And it is very essential that not only you follow the entire endometrium, in, uh, you follow the endometrium during the entire cycle, but you also do a sono histro. Sometimes the sinical bands are so, so firm, so thick that sono histro will not even distend the cavity, but still you can see that thick sinechi. The sinechi sono histro with 3D is probably one of the best modalities. Talking of sinechi, we know they are very common with chronic infections. And when we talk of chronic infections, tuberculosis cannot be forgotten. I mean, it's, it's just too much to not to talk about tuberculosis with infertility. Unfortunately, just like all other lab investigations, even the ultrasound does not have specific signs which can tell us that this is tuberculosis. But there are certain signs which are more commonly seen in tuberculosis as compared to other chronic inflammations. And one is persistently thin endometrium with a thick irregular endomyo junction, no vascularity in the subendometrial area. At times you will see fluid in the endometrial cavity when in the mid proliferative phase where normally there is no fluid and the entire inner margin of the endometrium is hyper echoic. And then we also have scarring of the endometrium, which is very well seen on the 3D ultrasound, but the most specific or the most commonly seen sign, uh, or I would say most um, often seen sign in, in tuberculosis is a vertical orientation of the interstitial part of the tube. Normally we know that the cornu move like that and the interstitial parts of the tubes are uh, uh, sort of oblique. Instead, if one of the interstitial part of the tube becomes vertical, that is a sign of tuberculosis. It may also lead to an absolutely contracted cavity or what commonly is again said as T-shaped cavity, which is not T-shaped, which is a narrow cavity. And you have micropolyposis and you may also have calcifications, calcified plex in the endometrium, in the endometrium, in the myometrium. You may also have uh, myometrial cysts like you have in adenomasis, but these do not have peripheral vascularity. So these are the signs of tuberculosis of the endometrium or tuberculosis in the uterus. So then, so those are the common abnormalities that you'll find in an abnormal, ut in, in an infertile patient, uh, patient's uterus. And then you go to the Edna X solutions. When you're talking about the Edna X solutions, again, I'm not going to discuss with you about Alta. Alta has been discussed a lot everywhere. It's very important for malignancy diagnosis. But when we are talking about infertile patients, well, malignancies are not very common. What are we often confused with? Is this a hemorrhagic cyst or a follicular cyst or a simple cyst? Or it is a corpus luteum? And what should I do with it? Should I remove it? Should I, should I treat it? Should I put the patient on OCPs? And therefore, this differential diagnosis is very, very important. So what I do is a simple way. Divide the, the adnex solutions according to their morphology. Non-septatic cleosis, septatic cleosis, cysts with internal equals, solid tumors, cysts with cystic and solid components. Okay. Chiefly, we are going to come across these three. These two are not very common. The septated cystic lesion, when I say septated cyst, non septated cystic lesion, means a lesion which does not have any internal echogenesis, which does not have any septa, and um, they have absolutely any quite clear contents. If it is in, inside the ovary, it is either a follicle or a follicular cyst or a simple cyst. If it is extra ovarian, the only possibility is the para ovarian cyst. How do I know that it is intra ovarian or extra ovarian? 
as we saw earlier for a sliding organ sign you you remember you saw a cyst and you saw the ovary and we were moving it we were moving the probe and the two would slide on each other that tells me it's an extra ovarian lesion if they do not move it may be aberrant or it may be intra ovarian now if it is intra ovarian we know that there would be a ream of ovarian tissue or a beak of ovarian tissue on the margins of the lesion and that tells me it's intra ovarian if the lesion cannot be moved or slide on the uh, on the ovary and there is no ream or beak sign that means it's extra ovarian but aberrant so it's easy to find out the origin now if it's intra ovarian and it's non septated clear cyst follicle follicular cyst simple cyst of course you have to correlate these with physiology when you're seeing it in the proliferative phase naturally first think of a follicle and if it shows peripheral vascularity when you put on doppler it has to be a follicle if it shows very scanty vascularity and the size is more than 25 mm you start thinking about the follicular cyst there is no vascularity at all that means you first think of a simple cyst you are seeing in the same lesion the proliferative phase naturally you will not think of follicle you first think of follicular cyst or a simple cyst and then if you still have a confusion do a follow up after 2 weeks and when you do that follicle is going to rupture follicular cyst will regress and it um, will start regressing i say uh, it doesn't resolve completely but starts regressing and if it is a uh, 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 simple cyst it remains the same so that is that is the beak sign that is the beak sign so uh, and that is a simple cyst and then we uh, apart from the dopplers yeah as i already told you you need to correlate it with the physiology and the changes that occur that is a para ovarian cyst which you can slide across now coming to the second you have a clear lesion but cyst with septum this may be multiple follicles commonest if you are seeing in the proliferative phase and of course also if it is a stimulated cyst or the second possibility is it may be a cyst cyst adenoma again only benign why because the thin follicular septa if they are thick like that you don't suspect a benign because you know that the septa which is thicker than 3 mm is not usually benign but when you have multiple follicles when you have a benign cyst cyst adenoma both have equally thin uh, septa both have clear contents usually there are no papillary projections and all and in this cases if if there is a vascularity seen in the septa it's usually and of course with the history of ovulation induction it's multiple follicles they may rupture so seeing after 2 weeks may again tell you and cyst cyst adenoma remains same or may grow extra ovarian septated lesion commonest peritoneal inclusion cyst loculated no floating bowel loops small septa i mean fluid inside is not under pressure so the septa move with respiration and pulsations you have one ovary close to it you may have a papillary uh, projection inside and uh, uh, if you press with the probe it will change its shape it doesn't empty against that if you think it may be a free fluid what what to do if it's a free fluid then you you diagnose it by the floating bowel loops inside and of course if there were pre existing adhesions you may still have adhesion band like structures the floating bowel loop definitely tells you it's a free fluid which is not present in a peritoneal inclusion cyst peritoneal inclusion cyst may also sometimes look appear something like this which appear similar to uh, to to hydrosalpins but we know that hydrosalpins always has an incomplete septa it doesn't have a complete septa so it's very important that whenever you are seeing a septum it's very important you must move across even if you're not seeing the septum it's very important any lesion that you see you should scroll across in both the orthogonal planes longitudinal and transverse before you confirm the exact morphology of the lesion <coughs> it is very i mean it's it's we all are very much acquainted with the description of a hydrosalpins in our books cogwheel appearance a fusiform appearance sausage shaped appearance but this is not always seen these are classical appearances not always seen if we just go into the reason why we see this we know it's a tubular structure it is it is uh, blown up and therefore when you um, see in a longitudinal plane you are going to see that fusiform or a sausage shaped shaped structure 
when it is an acute inflammation that's when you have thickened mucosa thickened hostra and when you see it in a transverse section therefore it appears like a cogwheel appearance remember thick walls and ascites tellus an acute inflammation thin walls hyperechoic walls and adhesion tellus a chronic inflammation but important message you see any cystic lesion in the adenexa must rotate and find out if it changes shape any change in shape is indicative even if there is a slight beak like extension as you can see here slight uh, beak like extension or flattening any change in shape slightest uh, 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 lengthening of the lesion has to be has the first thing you have to think is hydrosalpin of course you have to exclude possibility of vessels by doppler you have to exclude the possibility of bowel by peristalsis uh, but those are the two commonest differential diagnoses but you have to always think of a a, a hydrosalpin an extra ovarian lesion change in shape on uh, uh, rotation of the probe no color no peristalsis you have to think of a of a hydrosalpin acute hydrosalpinges may appear something like that sometimes where you have beaking on one side which is because of the narrowing in the normalizing part of the uh, tube or maybe close to the interstitial part of the tube where the distension is not that bad and you are seeing the the thickened walls and the hostra and that's acute and when it's chronic especially in tuberculosis you may often find very thick rigid walls and that may not allow huge uh, blowing up of the tube so there are two different types that you would find sometimes you have severely inflamed inflamed uh, uh, tubes or this may also be a hematosalpin unless you have a proper history you should not Uh, uh, commit it as hemato or bio. You just have to say it's a it's a fluid filled, uh, thick fluid fluid filled tube. You do not mention what it is. Three D plays a very important role, especially when you have a tortuous tube, large tortuous tube which appears like multiple anechoic areas. You put a three D, you use an inversion mode, and it will see the complete show the complete continuity of the lesion. So three D has a role. <clears throat> We know that hydrosalpinges most of the times are uh, uh, inflammatory, but they may also be because of endometriosis when they're inflammatory. We also know that it's usually associated with ulcerators, and uh, uh, tubo ovarian masses are quite common. You can see the tube. You can see the ovary. Both are either into each other. We know we call it tube ovarian masses. When you cannot define the margins in between, it becomes like a complex lesion. You say it is. I mean, uh, you you cannot define the ovarian margins and the tubular margins separately. A lot of fluid, thick fluid inside. You say it's a tube ovarian abscess. Talking of adnexal uh, um, lesions, I cannot I cannot uh, omit uh, talking about the tuberculosis again. for the adenexa and for the pelvic structures you may see free fluid with lot of septa inside the septa may show nodules and sometimes there may be lettuce like pattern with low level eicogenesis in the fluid you may also sometimes see cysts floating in the eicogenic fluid and these are all quite common with tuberculosis when you see a cyst floating like that very important to exclude fimbrials which is quite physiological so you must move across and find out whether fim there's any there any fimbria in the vicinity of the tube which excludes the possibility of a pathological cyst so that is about the 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 tuberculosis in the in the, in the next in the pelvic um, so it's a pelvic inflammation you may also see um, hyperechoic spots in the ovaries which is called ovarian calcinosis it's a misnomer it's not calcification it does not show any posterior shadowing but the hyperechoic spots this may is again not specific of tuberculosis it may be seen when any parenchymal insult to the ovary occurs and its direct relation to fertility is still not established an ovary which shows uh enteral follicles with or small follicles with hyperechoic margins uh and unexplained low vascularity of the ovaries again are to be suspected of tuberculosis so that is about the tuberculosis then we going to go to 
the third group of lesions, which is cystic lesions with internal echoes. Internal echoes, but no solid projections, no septa. And this, there are three lesions in this group. I've purposefully not named them because they all have an interchangeable 2D appearance. Fishnet or fibrin strands or a debris and a low level echoes. And these are found in hemorrhagic cysts, corpus luteum and the, the endometriomas. Of course, we know that corpus luteum and hemorrhagic cysts are both physiological. Uh, how do I exclude a possibility of solid uh, component or, uh, or a solid projection? I have a solid area there and push the probe in and out if the solid projection or the solid area moves in relation to the follicle uh, to the cyst wall, it is not a solid projection, it's a debris. Second, debris usually tries to settle with, with a, uh, I mean, um, according to the gravity and forms a label. But uh, so, so if you find any of those things, you know that you are not seeing a solid projection. Fibrin strand, especially when you are confused with, this is very typical of a fibrin strand, but if you are confused with, you only have to see, you rotate your probe and find out that that lesion, which appears like a septum, uh, does it show concavity on any point of rotation? As you can see here, if yes, that is a fibrin strand. If not, you suspect the septum. Of course, you can put on the vascularity and we know fibrin is never vascular, but even septum may be not vascular, so it's not confirmatory. This lesions, as I told you, intra-ovarian, maybe just this three, extra-ovarian, maybe pelvic hematoma or thick fluid, and corpus lutea, when I say, I just want to make it clear to you all, corpus lutea may have a variable appearance. They may appear like absolutely like a bowel, they may appear like hemorrhagic cysts, they may appear like endometriomas, and uh, they, the, they may appear absolutely isoechoic. It's the peripheral vascularity and secretory phase which tells you that it is a corpus luteum. Nice ring of color, complete ring of color. Hemorrhagic cyst is nothing but, I mean, unless the patient has a history of any other mass or anything which leads to a doubt of malignancy, physiologically, hemorrhagic cyst is nothing but a, a non-active Corpus luteum. So a corpus luteum, which is functionally stopped, uh, fun uh, uh, I mean, it's functionally regressed, but anatomically not regressed, and that is a hemorrhagic cyst. You have typical appearance, similar hem blood inside, blood products inside, but no vascularity. And these are all again hemorrhagic cysts. Endometriomas, again, similar appearance because it has blood and blood products, but we know it is more common to have a uh, uh, a typical uh, uh, ground glass appearance, as you can see here. What is very typical is those hyperechoic flex in the walls. Those hyperechoic flex in the walls are only seen in uh, chocolate cyst or an endometrioma, never seen in hemorrhagic cyst or in the corpus luteum. It is claimed to be because of either hemosiderin deposits or because of cholesterol. And apart from that, if you put on a Doppler, you will see tiny dots of color around, not like a corpus luteum. And these are called short coast vessels. And that is again typical of an endometrioma. Apart from that, we all know that we may also see a fluid label sometimes. And that is because of the debris and whole blood there and uh, the serum uh, floating. So you may get that fluid label. We also know that it, and, and, you know, um, endometriomas are always painful on probe pressure. Adhesions are common with endometriomas. Of course, these are not, I mean, adhesion is not an absolute sign. You may have a coexisting pathology with a corpus luteum and there may be adhesions, but yes, pain on probe pressure is quite, quite a very specific sign. You may have streaming sign because of the thick fluid that is called, that is called a caustic streaming sign. And these are all signs of endometriomas. Similar lesions, extra ovarian, maybe as I told you, pelvic hematoma or abscess, and we have already discussed about it. Whenever you find, I mean, if you are talking about the solid tumors, fibromas are the commonest. There is a long, long list, fibroma, fibrothicoma, Brenner's tumors, and so on. But they do not have very specific appearances. Fibromas, they typically appear like fibroids. Solid lesions, isoechoic to the ovarian stroma because ovarian stroma is normally mildly hypoechoic to the myometrium. Fibromas have same appearance as fibroids. Peripheral vascularity also. 
If they are small, they are often missed because they mix up with the stroma if you don't put on the Doppler. Whenever you see the stroma is excess, you must put on the Doppler to find out whether there's a fibroma or there's a PCO or there's a torsion or there's an oophritis. We will look, um, we will discuss the differential diagnosis if we get time, but yeah, we all show increased stroma. And the peripheral vascularity is specific of a fibroma. You may see a solid lesion with amorphous calcification and you may think of a Brenner's tumor. Bre uh, dermoid, we all are expert in diagnosing. You may have a fluid level with hypoechoic area posteriorly and hyperechoic anteriorly. We may have ground glass appearance. We may have hyperechoic dots, lines, spots. We may also have uh, uh, tooth-like lesions, uh, tooth-like hyperechogenicities with posterior shadowing. We may have hair balls. We may have snowballs, we may have hyperechoic blades and very, very important is you may have a shadow which typically appears like a bowel gas shadow. You can see the anterior margin, you cannot define the posterior margin. This may be bowel, this may be dermoid. But why is this a dermoid? Because it shows a weak sign of the ovary. So that is, that snowball sign is a very typical of a dermoid and should not be missed. Uh, then uh, with, with infertility, endometriosis is very, very common. And at the start of the lecture, I did tell you that you need to follow those tissue planes as well as the muscularis. And that is done by, um, by, by angulating the probe posteriorly because we know that the rectum is posteriorly and slowly follow the entire posterior vaginal wall. Uh, that is the anterior wall of the rectum. And as you do that, you're moving across and, and you can actually go right up to the sigmoid. And uh, you, you're just following those, uh, that muscular is there and you will see an irregularity in the muscular is a large irregular hypoechoic area with tiny hyperechoic flex in it. I'm going to freeze it as soon as we are right there. And uh, along with that, you see uh, those... Uh, feather-like extensions because of inflammation and adhesions. And uh, that tells you it is an endometriotic patch. We are going to just going to come there. It's necessary. Yeah, it, it, it needs, you need, yeah, there it is. Can you see that large endometriotic patch there? And that, that is how you locate endometri endometriosis. Yes, I agree that, that detect, detecting a bowel endometriotic patch needs a little bit of experience. It's a bit of a learning curve with it, but you can very confidently diagnose it. Earlier it was thought endometriosis cannot be diagnosed on deep and uh, infiltrating endometriosis cannot be diagnosed on ultrasound, but now ultrasound, I mean, there are people who specifically are just imaging for endometriosis and they are quite well, I mean, they, they are very, very accurately diagnosed. In fact, there are certain lesions which are also missed on MRI because that uh, the, the, the dynamic examination is not done and they are better diagnosed on ultrasound. Now coming, have, finishing the pathologies and going to the menstrual cycle assessment or the cycle treatment cycle assessment. We know that this is a very delicately balanced orchestra of hormones, multiple hormones, and it reflects almost instantaneously as vascular changes and a little later as morphological changes. If you want to study the morphological ch uh, changes, 2D ultrasounds. If you want to study the vascular changes, Doppler is a must. And the entire cycle, believe me, can be managed, can be monitored without any hormonal assess. Ultrasound monitoring it suffices and it is, it is a self-sufficient um, uh, uh, system to monitor the, the treatment cycles. As I told you, because the hormonal changes instantaneously reflect as vascular changes, Doppler is very important for a close watch. And if you want to do a good Doppler, if you want to interpret correctly, you need certain definite settings on your machine for your color and the power Doppler, PRF, pulse repetition frequency, has to be set at 0.3 wall filter at low one. And you need to adjust one. There's one, one uh, setting which is called gains, which you all know, color gains. The color should not spill out of the vessels. And the second is called balance. That means you should not get any snow on the color. 
Again, if it comes as questions, we will answer that. But right now, we are not going to discuss more about that. Uh, for the pulse wave Doppler, which gives you a spectrum. For that, your PRF can vary depending on the velocity that you are measuring, but usually it is between 0.9 to 1.3, wall filter 30 hertz, and again, balance and gains. And the sample volume, the distance between the two horizontal lines, always two millimeters for all infertility scans. Now, just for the sake of better, better understanding, we are going to divide the entire discussion into three phases, assessing um, the baseline scan, which is um, assessing the OR and reserve response and deciding the stimulation protocol, deciding the time of trigger, that's a pre-trigger scan, and a luteal field scan. Of course, I confess that it is not possible to actually divide this monitoring because it's a continuous cycle and continuous changes. This is just for the sake of convenience. When I say baseline scan, it is done on day two or three of the cycle. It is called a baseline scan because at that stage, the ovarian steroids are at their baseline. And even the, the FSH and LH are at their baseline. Of course, the bioactivity is very high, but their levels are low. What are my questions? If I'm doing a baseline scan, why I'm doing that baseline scan? One. How many follicles I'll get if I stimulate this patient? Two, watch, and that tells me the, I mean, that, that is ovarian in reserve. Two, what doses of gonadotropins will I require? And that tells me the ovarian response. And are the estrogen progesterone labels okay to start stimulation? And let us see how do we answer these questions. Just to make very, very clear that reserve and response are two different things. Reserve tells you about how many follicles you'll get at the end of stimulation, and that is decided by the enteral follicle count and the ovarian volume. Whereas ovarian response tells you how what doses of stimulation, what doses of gonadotrophins will be required to stimulate that ovary to produce those decided number of follicles. There's a difference in reserve and response. And as I told you, reserve can be uh, calculated by counting the enteral follicles. We have already seen how to count the enteral follicles on 2D. And uh, so it's just scrolling across and eyeballing. But if the number of follicles are up to 12 to 15, whether you are using this method, 2D, or you are using sophisticated 3D method, both are equally accurate. But when it's a PCO patient, when the number of follicles are more than about 15, 17 times 20, that's when there's a high chance of manual error. And therefore, in those cases, we use a, a sophisticated 3D software, which is called Sono ABC. And that saves time because it color codes all the follicles. Not only that, it also gives size, X, Y, Z diameter, mean diameter, and volume of each and every follicle. So that is a very important uh, uh, note to make when there are multiple follicles. We will discuss later why do we need to know the size of the follicles of the enteral follicles is it not just sufficient to know that all follicles between two and nine are totally this many or do we need to classify them we'll, we'll discuss that a little later enteral follicle count is just sufficient for the assessment of the ovarian reserve and there's huge huge literature evidence but i'm just going to name a few or, or point out a few the number of small enteral follicles represents the functional ovarian reserve. It is the best, it has the best discriminating potential for poor ovarian reserve patients compared to the total ovarian volume and base and serum levels of FSH E2, inhibin B, everything. Prediction of poor ovarian response. For prediction of poor ovarian response, a model including AFC and AMH was found to be almost similar to that of using AFC alone. For hyper response, both are equally safe. Um, in our study where we compared AFC and AMH for the normal group and for the PCO group, for the two end results, number of oocytes retried, and number of follicles larger than 12 millimeter on the day of trigger, both the parameters, I mean, both the, 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 the uh, uh, markers, the AFC and AMH, uh, for both the groups, for both the end results, did not show significant difference. And therefore, since then, 2012, we are using only AFC. 
in fact we also have a series of 70 patients in whom amh was less than 0.8 and they have all conceived within 2 3 cycles 2 to 3 cycles of iui forget about ivf then coming to uh, the the uh, in the pco group in pco group afc is highly sensitive for all phenotypes whereas amh is high, more sensitive only for the anovulatory patients even in endometriosis where we generally expect low response if the vascularity is good the patient is, i mean if if sorry if the afc is good the patient is still going to give sufficient number of eggs uh coming to the um, i mean uh, coming to the patients in whom we are going to go do a controlled ovarian stimulation for them also it is the most important risk marker for that uh the number of retract results correlate of course with the enteral follicle count and ovarian volume but that is all about the reserve talking about the response what doses i will have to give so that they produce those number of eggs and that is dependent on the stromal flow in the early follicular phase that tells me about the ovarian response vi fi and vfi of the ovary were significantly related to the ovarian response to stimulation what is this new thing now we are hardly i know what you're saying all in your minds we are hardly acquainted to ri and psv and pi and now you're saying about vi fi and vfi and this are not very complicated things believe me this are i'm not going to talk too much about this i just want to make you realize they are important vi vascularity index tells us about the global abundance of the flow fi flow index tells us about the average intensity of the flow and vfi vascularity flow index tells us about the perfusion in the entire volume so these are 3d Uh, power doppler indices which tell you about the global vascularity when you're going to when you're doing a routine doppler you're just assessing one two three vessels you're not seeing a global vascularity here these are global vascularity indices and therefore more reliable it's not a a, a very time consuming calculation you just do a 3d you use a vocal software to scoop out the volume of interest and just press what is called a volume histogram and you will get those measurements i'm not going to discuss more about that but it is important to know that there are several studies done on that and they all have proved that better vascularity values means better response in fact i have not included one slide of this same study which has also defined numbers less than 11 fi poor response more than 15 fi risk of ohss and so on even in patients with endometriosis if the vascularity is good they are going to respond well so same for the afc same for the uh, vascular indices whether there is endometriosis no endometriosis whether it's pco no pco this this parameters are important to us so the logical explanation to that is that if the vascularity of the ovary is good more amount of total gonadotrophins loaded into the patient system whether they are exogenous or endogenous flows into the ovary and therefore total doses required are less but if the flow to the ovary is less less percentage of the total gonadotrophins present in the blood are going to flow into the ovary to so supply sufficient drugs you have to load more into the patient system so good flow hyper responder less flow poor responder and there's not just 3d power doppler studies there are also 2d studies higher psv after, even after pituitary suppression means better response those who are low psv poor response and we have from the literature evidence and our experiences found out certain values which tell us about hyper responding and poor responding ovaries the patients who have ri ovarian stromal ri of less than 0.58 psv more than 10 are hyper responders the ri more than 0.7 <coughs> excuse me psv more than 5 poor responders so we have definite values which tell us but how do we measure the stromal flow on the baseline scan always put on the doppler covering the entire ovary as you see the color you should scroll across find out the brightest spots once you find the brightest spots rotate your probe and confirm that this spot is not a continuation of the main ovarian artery if it is so just scroll your probe laterally from there 
and you will not be in the midline at all. You will not be in the in the axis of the hilum at all. And whatever vessels you see are stromal vessels, provided these vessels are not close to the follicles. If they are close to the follicles, they are perifollicular again. So you have to pick up any of these vessels, brightest ones, and measure the flow. And that is your stromal flow. There's a study which has years back, years back, it has all it had already confirmed that if you just consider enteral follicle count, stromal FI, ovarian volume, and the stromal area, these are the four most reliable parameters to decide the stimulation protocols. But since ultrasound is still thought to be not my modality, so that's why that's why we have been all not considering uh, uh, ultrasound, but taking into account the hormonal parameters. We, done, we have done a lot of pilot studies and we have found certain parameters which tell us these are the patients who would require higher doses, these are the parameters which would demand for lower doses. And based on that, we devised a scoring system in 2016. And since then we are using the same system. We have already done more than 5,000 cases now. And the, the merit of this is, the credit of this is that we have not seen a single patient of moderate or severe OHSS. Mild OHSS is only 0.05%. And that is, and the cancellation rate because of poor response is also very scanty, very scanty, hardly countable. So what we do is on the baseline scan, we would note the age BMI, AFC, ovarian volume, stromal RA and PSV put the values into the, into the relevant boxes, count the total score, depending on that, depending on what is the total score, we have doses decided for IUI, IVF, fresh cycle and IVF, frozen cycles. And this tells us exactly what number of, I mean, what, what, how much dose we need to get and how much, uh, how many follicles we are going to get at the end of stimulation. If you see here, it's only in the frozen cycles and with a very low score that I've added LH. If the patient does not respond with this parameters, when do I say the patient does not respond? When I see on the fifth day of the stimulation and on that day of stimulation, if I am not seeing any increase in the endometrial thickness or no dominant follicle, only then it is no response. If one of the two is growing, the patient is responding. And if the patient is responding, you continue the same dose. If not, you can increase the dose on day five if the score was very low. If the score was between 10 and 20, you will increase on day seven. And if it is the score is higher, you increase on day 10 and that to half the dose. And if it's even higher score, your severe PCO, you only increase on 14th day in IUL side. In IVF cycles, here there's an important and an interesting thing. If the score was very low and the patient didn't respond, that is also the only group where we added LH. Otherwise, we only added RFSH. And why did we add LH there? The patient had a very low score, which means not only the reserve parameters were low, but the vascularity was also low. Vascularity of the stroma, is, of course, VEGF is responsible, but LH is also responsible. LH leads to neoangiogenesis and catecholaminergic stimulation, leukocyte cytokine activation, which leads to more blood vessels and low resistance blood flow. That means if I'm seeing a patient who has a good stromal blood flow, which means that she's going to respond well, which also means that she has normal levels of LH, and I don't need to supplement. But if she has less flows, not only that she's going to not respond well, but either LH is low, or is low bioactivity, or is polymorphism. So that LH is not perceived by the ovaries. And therefore, these are the patients in whom LH uh, supplementation is required. And this is exactly what is told for the Poseidon group one and two, where the reserve parameters are normal, but the patient is not responding, and so the next cycle you add LH. Now, when to start stimulation? If we know that the dominance of the cycle is, uh, dominance of follicle is selected day five becomes evident usually on day five, latest by day seven. So if you're doing an IUI cycle, don't start stimulation, gonadotropin stimulation 
before day five. That will lead to multifollicular development. In IVF, we require multifollicular development, so we start stimulation on day two. But in IUI, you should not start before your, the dominance is selected. Moreover, when you have all the follicles smaller than six millimeter, these are the follicles which do not have FSH receptors. And if um, you start stimulation, when all the follicles are smaller than six millimeters, the initial two or three days is that you have given FSH, that FSH only increases the blood level. It actually does not act on the follicles. And therefore, when you see on day five, in spite of your good doses, normal doses, required doses of FSH, these patients will not show follicular growth. If you increase the dose, then they are going to go into multifollicular development. But in these cases, you have to consider those two days as reserve and you have to then continue the same stimulation for two more days. And then also patient doesn't respond only then you increase the dose. So ultrasound gives you a great, create a huge information, a very precise information as to what should be the dose, when to start, how, when to increase everything. <clears throat> then coming to the endometrial assessment on the baseline scan. Endometrium, we know on the baseline should be thin, should be avascular. Why? If it is thick or it is vascular, if the, the, the junctional zone is intact, then it may be high estrogen or high progesterone. And you look at the ovary, if ovary shows a early recruitment of the follicle or an active corpus luteum, you know the reason. Or there may be a PCO patient in whom you will have a thick endometrium in spite of all small follicles. If the junctional zone is irregular, think of either adenomyosis, but adenomyosis usually gives thinner endometrium. But most important is acute endometritis. And it can be diagnosed only in the early uh, uh, proliferative phase. Because of the acute inflammation, it is thickened, it is hypervascular. Then, how do you know that which follicle is going to grow? We know that when the dominance, when, when the follicle reaches the size of 10 millimeters, the dominance is achieved, and this is the follicle which is likely to grow. But many a times it happens that the first follicle that you see has, is, uh, is 10 millimeters, does not grow. Why? Because <clears throat> though it is seen there, it might be a, a residual follicle of the previous cell. You put on the Dopplers, if it shows any flows, it is the freshly recruited follicle of that cell. Early recruitment. What does that early recruitment tell us? High FSH, short cycles. And you should ideally not waste a single cycle in this patient. So don't omit the cycles. Remember, you can do IUIs as early as day eight or nine of the cycle with good results as late as day 40, 45, good results. We all have probably not remembered our physiology. Our physiology books only define the length of the secretory phase, not the length of the proliferative phase. And this is very important. The rate of growth of the follicle is very important. It must increase at a rate of 2 to 3 millimeters a day. If not, it might not be a good quality follicle. Wall thickness should be thin, isoechoic to the stoma. Hyperechoic wall means luteinized follicle. And there should be no internal echogenesis. Again, it indicates possibility of a luteinized follicle, so old follicle of the previous cycle. And vascularity is I told. Why vascularity is important at that stage also? Because as soon as the dominance is selected, the vessels are pulled towards that follicle. And this represents the rising level of estrogen. We all know that follicle when it reaches 18 to 24 millimeters, it's going to rupture. But before 24 to 36 hours of rupture, you'll see a hypoechoic halo and you'll see the cumulus-like structure, solid projection, both 24 to 36 hours before the ovulation. And six to 10 hours before the ovulation, you'll see low level echogenesis. It is a linear, a faint linear shadow, which is because of the separation and folding of the follicle lining as a, as, as a preparation for ovulation. So these are the important 2D signs which tell you it's an impending ovulation. Volume has a role, especially when you have multiple follicles like in IVF. Since they are not rounded, you need a 3D to count their exact volume. And so now we see the tool. And it's much more accurate than your 2D. 
Cumulus is the second thing which is much better seen on 3D. Of course, you are not going to confirm it in all and if you don't see the cumulus, you are not going to uh, postpone your trigger. But especially in poor reserve patients, <coughs> especially in IVF cycles, if you have seen a cumulus and you don't retrieve the ovum, in these cases, you do flushing. That is where flushing has a problem. Otherwise, not. The perifollicular RI, as the estrogen level shoots up, it <clears throat> falls two days before, 48 hours before the ovulation. At the start of the surge, the follicle is covered two third to three fourths of its circumference with blood vessels with an RI of less than 0.48 and PSV of more than 10 centimeters per second. And this is very important to see because it correlates with the cell recovery rates in IVF. It also indicates that if the flow is less, the ovum inside is hypoxic, there's a high chance of chromosomal abnormalities and there are more than one study saying the same. And the more uniform perifollicular vascular network indicates a better chance of pregnancy. This is because it indicates more estrogen, that means better quality follicle, and that can be done by 3D power Doppler vocal and volume histogram as we discussed. I'm not going to discuss the values in detail, but it has been proved that if you don't get results with your B mode and Doppler monitoring, you must add 3D to it because there's something which you're missing. You are calling it an unexplained. It's not an unexplained, it's an unexplored infertility. Minimum parameters for the follicle, a follicle size of 16 to 18 millimeters. In CC, you might have to wait till 24 millimeters. Vascularity covering at least two thirds, preferably three fourths of the circumference. RI less than 0.5 and PSV more than 10 centimeters per second, minimum parameters. What happens after this? The surge has already started. The LH starts rising. As the LH starts rising, <clears throat> the vascular and the estrogen also is rising. So there's an increase in the vascularity of the follicle wall. And LH also increases not only the abundance, but the PSV of the, vascular, uh, of, of the blood vessels. And it's about 29 hours before the ovulation. That means after the gentle slope of LH is over and it starts rising suddenly, the same time PSV also starts peaking up. That means that, and it reaches as high as about 45 centimeters per second an hour before the ovulation. <clears throat> that means when the surge starts, the PSV is 10 and it rises to 45. If I'm doing a pre-trigger scan, RI is low and the PSV is 15, 20, 25. That means I'm not here on the search. I'm somewhere here. That means ovulation is not going to occur after 36 to 42 hours. It's going to occur early. And it is in this cases that early IUI helps. In this cases, <coughs> we have done, excuse me. We have done two IUIs, one at 12 to 14 hours, one second at 36 to 38 hours. And as you can see, the double IUI, yellow bars, uh, pregnancies with yellow bars are much taller when the PSV was more than 20. So all the patients where the PSV pre-trigger PSV is more than 20, we suggest two IUIs. Coming to the endometrium, we know that with the rise of estrogen, as early as seven day of the cycle, the endometrium starts becoming multilayered. Then it grows in thickness. Earlier, it is multilayered with intervening area, which is almost hypo, uh, anechoic or severely hypoechoic. This is called grade B. This usually corresponds with the estrogen levels of 100 to about 250, uh, 300 picogram per ml. That means one or two follicles. When there are more than one or two follicles, estrogen level is more. That's when you get a grade A endometrium. Interbinary area shows ecogenicities, but not more than that of the normal myometrium. And when there are supraphysiological levels, you get an isoechoic homogeneous endometrium, which is called grade C endometrium. So the, the grades of the endometrium do not define the endometrial quality. It only tells you indirectly about the follicular quality and the estrogen levels. <clears throat> what is important then for the quality? It is the vascularity because as the estrogen rises, the endometrial thickness rises. You can see the cervical mucus and you'll see the vascularity of the endometrium and the vascularity of the endometrium reaches maximum about <clears throat> three days, 72 hours before the trigger. How do you measure the vascularity there? You must always see the endometrium almost perpendicular to the sound beam in the center of the image 
put on the color box and should be small enough to include only the upper half of the endometrial thickness. That's where the implantation is going to occur. And that's how you would measure the flow with the SAID Doppler parameters we have already discussed. When the vascularity reaches the intervening area or the central line, it is called zone 3 or zone 4 vascularity. <coughs> and this is important for the implantation to occur. These vessels must also have a low RI, less than 0.6. And the vascular area, the total vascular area in this zone should be at least 5 millimeters square. If not, the chances of implantation are low, chances of abortion are more. Vascularity is much more important than the thickness and morphology. It's the most important prognostic marker for ongoing pregnancy. It is the most important, if it is absent, it's the most important marker for failure of implantation. And even if the implantation occurs, there's a very, very high chance of abortion. And this has been proved in several studies and, and this study of ours also have shown huge difference in the a pregnancy rate with vascularity in zone 3 and 4 and huge decrease in the abortion rate with vascularity in zone 3 and 4. Endometrial volumes are only important when the endometrium is persistently thin and you are waiting for the frozen embryos to get transferred. If the volume of the endometrium is more than 2.5 cc, the chances of implantation are significantly good, especially if the vascularity is also good and the PSV is more than 5. Even when we consider 3D power Doppler parameters, better vascularity means better chance of pregnancy. And this is especially important when you are not sure about the embryo quality, which usually you are not. And therefore, if you improve the endometrial quality, the chances of implantation is going to improve. I agree that if the endometrial vascularity is very good, but the embryo quality is not at all good, the implantation is not going to occur. But if there is a compromise to be done, if the embryo is even fairly good and the endometrium is very good, the chances of implantation are very good. So that is why you must look at the endometrial vascularity. Apart from that, you must also assess the uterine artery PI. It should be always less than 3.2. How do you assess it? When you are scrolling across the uterus from the midline with sagittal plane to the let to laterally, you will see a serpentinous tubular structure entering into the uterus. You can see there, and that is the uterine vessel. And you can just put on. You can see it here. You can just put on a color there, and you can measure the flow in any of these loops before it bifurcates and that pi should be less than 3.2 so the minimum endometrial parameters endometrial thickness of at least 6 millimeter preferably 8 to 10 millimeters uh, grade can be anything vascularity must reach zone 3 and 4 and should have a low ri less than 0.6 and a uterine attribute should be less than 3.2 now if i'm coming to a timeline i would say that IUI must be done if, uh, uh, predicting when the ovulation is going to occur and not after you have confirmed ovulation. After I confirm ovulation, I don't know how many hours before ovulation has occurred. And then I'm spending at least two, three hours telling, scanning the patient, asking for the semen, processing the things. So I'm decreasing the chance of consumption. So you must predict ovulation. And how can you predict that? 72 hours before the ovulation, the endometrial vascularity is going to grow. 48 hours before, RI is going to fall. Of course, these two will almost occur uh, uh, together in stimulated cycles. The, the cumulus-like shadow may appear. Even if you cannot see that, you can see the hello, which is again 36 hours before, 29 hours before the, the, the PSV starts picking up and 6 to 10 hours before you'll see the internal apogenicity. So you can exactly predict where, when this is going to occur. But remember, these studies must be done before giving trigger because once you give trigger, there is going to be a fall in estrogen and the progesterone is going to take about four days to rise. This is a period when the uterine artery resistance will severely rise and the endometrial vascularity will decrease. And this is the need of physiology. We need low oxygen in the endometrium, which will stimulate VEGF and which will produce more vascularity to support the 
embryo. So that is a need of physiology which is supported by that. And that means we come to a very important uh, uh, note. If the uterine artery PI is high, you are doing a pre-trigger scan, uterine artery PI is high. And the PSV of the follicle is also high, which means the surge has already started, you need to run earlier. But if the PSV of the follicle is low, the follicle is still not mature and you need to continue with the stimulation. Now you are afraid about that high progesterone before the trigger or yeah, before the trigger. That 1.5 nanogram is not important as a 1.5 nanogram. Its effect on the endometrium is what is important. And that effect of endometrium is seen by fluffiness of the endometrium. We know that in a normal patient also. Um, uh, Dr. Harshad, I'll take five more minutes. Is that okay? Oh, okay Dr. Chetan, yes ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma yes, ma Please go ahead. So, what happens is that we know that in a normal cycle, if you go back and look there, the progesterone actually starts rising before ovulation. That progesterone does show its effect on the endometrium, right? And that effect is fluffiness of the outer margin of the endometrium. If you remember the endometrium that we saw earlier for the grade A and grade B, it was a sharp line outside. Now this becomes like you have drawn a line with a highlighter. And that is the effect of physiological levels of progesterone and physiological time exposure of progesterone. This occurs when the ovulation, I mean, when the progesterone, the, the endometrium is exposed to progesterone about up to 24 hours. If the exposure is more than 24 hours, that means the ovulation has already occurred before about 6 to 12 hours. And the level of progesterone and or the progesterone, level of progesterone is higher which is going to already start secretory changes and damage the endometrium, that's when you will see hyperechoic outer line of the endometrium. If you see this, you don't give a trigger because your, I mean, you don't transfer in that cycle, I would say. You don't transfer in that cycle. But if you see this, it's very good for IUI cycles. It's very good for fresh transfers. This hyperechogenicity is gradually going to progress towards the center. It's only in the mid luteal phase that the entire endometrium will become hyperechoic. Thinking of vascularity again, taking you back for just a minute. The ovulatory highest vascularity decreases during the implantation window and immediately after ovulation and again increases in the mid luteal phase. Follicles are too many, especially the medium sized follicles. If we go to the reference, I don't remember exactly. I think if, if I'm not wrong, it's Madden. And what he said is if the total number of follicles in an IVF cycle are more than 25, size more than 11 millimeters, these are the patients you do not give any HCG, only give agonist. Correct. Now, how do you measure this follicle? So many follicles you cannot measure, and that's where ultrasound gives you help. 3D ultrasound, sonar AVC gives a complete list. How many follicles, X, Y, Z diameter, mean diameter, volume. You know, okay, there are so many follicles which are larger than 11 millimeters. I'll give this trigger, I'll give against trigger, or I'll give a dual trigger, or I'll give only X trigger. So, which trigger to give? You also get an idea from your ultrasound. Mutual phase scan, which is usually not done, but it's very important, especially in your IUI cycle gives you a vision into what you have done during the entire ovulation induction in the proliferative phase was right or it needs some modification. The progesterone levels, they correspond with the corpus luteal RI. The normal RI should be less than 0.5. If this is the case, then the progesterone level is, progesterone production is normal. If progesterone receptor development is normal, the spiral arteries also show an RI of less than 0.5. And the uterine artery PI is between 2 and 2.5. This is a normal luteal phase. If it is an abnormal luteal phase, it may be because of LUF or LPD. LUF, we know, why does it occur? Because either the surge was inadequate or the surge came in when the follicles were not mature still, functionally mature. And in this case, there is exposure of granulosa cells to LH, there's conversion to theca cells, but not sufficient. And therefore, progesterone production is less. Progesterone production is less, the resistance is going to be high. Along with that, 
because of the low progesterone, the initial compact effect on the endometrium is less. The endometrium becomes hyperechoic, but doesn't then start growing. So it's hypovascular, hyperechoic, but thin. So luteal, so that is the, and, and in that case, what I can do, I can, I, I know that I've probably given trigger at the wrong time. And I have to monitor my follicle better with, with Doppler. And if I'm going to, or I can check the, the quality of my trigger drug. If a luteal phase defect, we know it may be because of either inadequacy of the corpus luteum or failure of corpus luteum, or it may be because of inadequate progesterone receptors. If it's because of inadequacy of the corpus luteum, very hypovascular corpus luteum, and of course, thin, non hyperechoic non vascular endometrium. And corpus luteum, if it fails, HCG supports. So next cycle, you can give HCG, you can add HCG as a support. Whereas if it's because of non, uh, I mean, uh, low progesterone receptors in the endometrium, corpus luteal flows are normal, but the endometrium is not showing good secretory changes. In this case, the main possibility is inadequate. Right? We know that if the estrogen priming is inadequate, the progesterone receptors will not develop. You have to modify your ovulation production. How? The minimum estrogen priming required for the endometrium is uh, is in duration and in uh, level of estrogen. So when you wait for the follicles to grow to not only a size, but vascularity, proper vascularity tells that the estrogen levels have reached the desired levels. And the time from the dominance to the day of trigger should be at least four to six days. And that tells you your estrogen priming is sufficient. So you need to modify your 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 stimulation protocol according. These are just some values which are telling you about how high and how low are the values in luteal phase defects and in, in normal. And just quickly going to three or four tricky situations. I have a follicle of more than 10 millimeter on my day or two, three scan. I've already told you I'll put on a Doppler. If it's an acute, active follicle of that cycle, it will show me flows. If it shows flows, means FSH is high, FSH, FSH is high. I don't have my... It, it, it doesn't mean actually FSH is high. It means FSH is rising. So even before the FSH goes 15, 17, which is a pathological level, you start knowing that now the cycles are going to be short because the, there's early recruitment of the follicle. And this, these patients, I don't have a very long time. I have to be a little more aggressive about my treatment. Along with that, the endometrium will also show multilayer pattern as early as day 3, 4, 5. Uh, and the bleeding will stop. Whereas if it was an active corpus luteum, when do I say active corpus luteum? There's a residual corpus luteum. And if I put on the flows, it still shows me resistance index of less than 0.5. And then I will have a thicker hyperechoic endometrium. And these patients will complain of inadequate uh, uh, throw of blood. So inadequate menstrual flow. So that is about the thicker endometrium. Then you have a thin endometrium in the pre -ovulatory. Of course, one and the very important thing is that the follicle is not good quality. You have a size, you don't have flows. Don't have flows, that means the estrogen level is low and therefore the endometrium is thin. If that is not the case, you must look at the junctional zone. If it is altered, think of adenomasis, which will also show myometrial abnormality or chronic endometritis. If there is not an associated myometrial lesion, chronic endometritis will show normal myometrial. Intact junctional zone, it was a CC cycle, think of hyperprolactinemia, or it may be a surgical incident. If I have a pre ovulatory endometrium, which is thick, but I'm not seeing the follicle. First, ECO. Second, recent rupture. Recent rupture, I'll know by fluffy endometrium. So, and finally, non rupture because of trigger is, as I told you, in, uh, inadequate maturity of the follicle. And this, this is very important and very, very. Um, important to, to avoid OHSS also. The LH, uh, the follicles respond to LH at different times, different ways. If the follicle is absolutely mature, there are sufficient LH receptors and LH ruptures the follicle, ovulation. Happens. But if it is suboptimally mature, that means it's 16, 17, 18 millimeter, the vascularity is not sufficient. That means it gets luteinized, but it does not rupture. And the follicles of 11 to 14 millimeter size, it shares FSH and LH receptors. So even if you give LH, it feels it has got FSH and starts growing. Just these follicles, therefore, which are responsible for OHSS. That means 
where B mode ultrasound only tells us about the anatomical status of the follicle and the endometrium. It is the Doppler that speaks about the functional status and the hormonal changes and 3D adds to the global assessment. So ultrasound is the tool. If, if Arjun had Teer Kaman, we should have as an infertility person ultrasound and we should master it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for that very patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think that was an excellent that was an excellent lecture, um, excellent presentation, um, simple yet detailed. And um, uh, um, what you said about that, a uh, lot of things that we talked of is unexplained. Actually, they are more of unexplored. I think that is the very important take home message that we all need to go ahead and learn more and more so that we will be able to get better and good results uh, in this condition. Uh, Prakash. Uh, uh, can we go the question and answer? Yeah, please, please, please go ahead. But you are not audible. Your volume is very low. You have the questions? Uh, most of the questions are answered. A few questions are there. I think most of the lecture, most of the, uh, these are more congratulatory to you about a very incredible and excellent talk. That's what I am seeing here. Uh, one question is there, what is sliding sign to differentiate between the extravagant cyst and intravagant cyst? Yeah. So whenever there is an extra, whenever there's an adenex solution, you would focus your probe in such a way that you are seeing the adenex solution and you are seeing the ovary side by side or close to each other or maybe above and below. Now when, if they are separate, when you push with the probe, you will slide them each other, uh, over each other or they will separate them and the bowel will intervene. When that occurs, it is called a positive sliding sign. That means the lesion is not attached to or not arising from the ovary. But if you cannot move the two separately or not slide them over each other, which means it's either adherent or arising from that organ. I mean, it's not only for ovary, it's for any organ and uh, a lesion associated with that. Whether it's an intrauterine lesion or intraovarian lesion, or even if we are doing abdominal scans, hepatic and anything. So that, that's how it is. Uh, one more question is there. Is there any particular dimension to take the antral follicular count in ovarian reserve? Uh, dimension, you mean dimension of the follicles? It is 2 to 9 millimeters are antral follicles. Okay. But yes, if you go into more details, there are a lot of studies and there, there, there are some, there's some literature which mentions only 2 to 5 should be selected, 6 to 9 should be selected, but these are still not um, accepted as guidelines. So, so far, 2 to 9 is the guideline. Okay. Uh, all rest messages are thank you, excellent talk, and they were greeting to thank you. you very much, sir. And few of the delegate from the foreign countries also, they are daily uh, greeting to you also. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Sonal, madam. Thank you, Arshad, sir, and Chaitanya. Can we move, uh, move ahead? Uh, coming to the second session. Uh, the second session is a panel discussion. Panel discussion is on uh, correlating infertility pathologies uh, with UAG. For this panel discussion, let's learn the tips and tricks uh, by using the sonography probe for diagnosing the various pathologies in day-to-day -day practice. And let's understand the management. For this panel discussion, uh, we have two moderator. Uh, the first of all is Dr. Kundan Ingre. Uh, Kundan is there. Yes, yes, yes. I'm right over here. He's there. Yeah, yeah. To introduce Kundan is a pleasure me. Uh, he is chairperson of Foxy Invertility Committee 2020-2022. He is director of Nirmita Clinic Center for ART and Endoscopy. Uh, he is fast uh, general secretary POGS. Uh, he has received second best research paper award in uh, ESAR 2018 and 2019. Uh, he has uh, uh, first, he has presented first original research paper on 6th World Congress at Vietnam on use of GCSF subcutaneously for thin endometrium. 
and he presented rct on fresh embryo transfer versus frozen embryo transfer at world congress at new delhi in 2016 uh this is kundan and second chair moderator is uh, dr ashwini kale she is ivf consultant and chief embryologist from asha kiran hospital and asha ivf center she is presently general secretary pogs she is chairman uh, chairperson amox ytp committee she is treasurer maharashtra chapter isar she is zonal coordinator for amox uh, 2016 and 18 peer reviewer of journal of obstetrics and gynecology in india and she is ex uh, ex assistant professor from bj medical college i request both of you to start the panel discussion and invite the panelists yeah thank you so much prakash sir uh, first of all i'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of pogs and thank our president harshad sir for this innovative webinars so to introduce our panelist we have dr nilesh balkaude with us who is the chairperson elect for quiz committee from pune he was also the joint secretary pogs pune he is the clinical head and fertility specialist at oss pune he has many publications to his credit and he is also the winner of dr usha krishnan quiz in 2009 and he has also got the best debutant pogs smita zog award in 2014 can i have the next panelist please then we have dr pankaj kulkarni with us who is a very senior gynecologist and a fertility expert with the sakhi clinic and he is also attached at galaxy hospital pune we have dr nitin lard from nasik with us who is uh, the director at lard's navjeevan hospital he is also an fiicog md and these are his other credits can i have the next panelist please we have dr mamta dighe from pune with us who is the director at zenith advanced fertility center pune she was also the past director at ivf unit at dinanath mangeshkar she was the organizing secretary at fertifest scientific chairperson and a very active pogs member the next panelist please then we have dr amol lunkard with us who is also a managing committee member of pogs team 2020 he has been awarded with multiple awards the prestigious indumati zaveri prize at aicog the suli rudra sinha prize for the best advanced gynae endoscopy surgery by foxy and many uh, oral presentation prizes he is a author and co-author of about 28 national and international research papers and chapters he is the chief ivf specialist at indira ivf yeah kundan can you start sharing your screen after this yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Chaitanya would join us late. He is stuck up in some emergency, but he would also be there. He is a uh, director at Omega Hospitals from Nagpur. He is also the past president of Nagpur OBGYN Society. Thank you, Mandar. Yeah, just give me one minute. I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I welcome all of you once again for this uh, uh, panel discussion on correlating infertility pathologies with ultrasound. I think after uh, the Dr. Sonal Panchal Madam's lecture, I think lot of many things already been cleared about ultrasound and infertility and what's the correlation of ultrasonic findings with infertility pathologies. Uh, uh, we will we'll discuss. We will be discussing certain case scenarios. Probably that will help us to understand that how. ultrasound helped us to uh, take a decision whether we should do uh, some surgical management whether we should intervene or should we just do a conservative management so i think uh, i uh, there are few requests to all my panelists that uh, the questions will be specifically uh, asked to one panelist so uh, i request that panelists will answer so that we don't want chaos of multiple uh, if you want to comment then uh, you can raise hand and i can ask and come back to you Uh, i have dr ashwini kaye with me as a uh, uh, co moderator and uh, we have already introduced with uh, our panelists and this is what i don't want uh, a panelist to do that uh, you know do the same answer if you have something different management please come up and differ with what other panelists says and we want a lot of discussion we don't want to hear any evidence what evidence is what we want to hear what uh, you do in your practice and infertility and ultrasound is something like this where infertility practice without ohg is like living married life without wife so it is just not possible to do a infertility practice where, i mean without ultrasound uh, ultrasound is something where we need to scan our patients on every visit 
and for different assessment levels i think uh, you just saw that how detailed we can use ultrasound for a, such a minute uh, as a, a minute assessment in infertility and i think it's a very very integral part of the infertility practice uh, it is very useful as i said and indispensable and transvaginal route is the best way to do ultrasound especially when we are tackling infertility because we have a better visibility we have a accuracy of diagnosis and we are whole advantage of placement of the high frequency probe to the pelvic organs which we want to assess and uh, 3d is something which has really changed the uh, our uh, uh, assessment uh, for the uterine abnormalities or even the ovarian and adnexal pathologies so accurate diagnosis is possible now characterization of uterine abnormalities especially a, a kind of a difficult differential diagnostic situations like for example septate uterus versus bicornate uterus best can be picked up by uh, 3d ultrasound not only that we even it helps us sometimes uh, a fibroid which is protruding towards the endometrial cavity we have we can evaluate antral follicles as uh, dr uh, uh, sonal madam has already mentioned about sonovac and very very precise calculation of ovarian and endometrium volume so i think it has really given us a additional hand i will say a third hand for ourselves to do a much much better job then comes a power doppler which is again a uh, kind of gone into so much detail of minute vas vascularity of endometrium and the ovarian assessment and it's a very very important uh, tool uh, for assessment of development of uh, i mean assessment of endometrial receptivity markers as well as the oocyte quality and quantity to predictors which we can uh, really uh, by assessing endometrial and ovarian vasculation status so i think ultrasound is very very important and uh if somebody is not doing uh, ultrasound and doing infertility infertility practice i will always be sure that they will realize that the results are compromised and that is why doing your own ultrasound is the important so uh, ashwini i'll uh, ashwini will start the first case over to you ashwini yeah thank you kulan so it's as you mentioned that it's very very important to do your own scans so that you can correlate it clinically also and that is what we want to bring out through these cases so this is our first case wherein a 30 year old couple has primary infertility of 4 years the husband has normal semen parameters and as you can see this is the usg finding which shows a 5 cm ovarian cyst with a ground glass appearance typically she also has severe dysmenorrhea so i would want any one of you to tell me uh, what is your diagnosis and would you like to treat this woman medically or surgically for her infertility and how would you start investigating her any of you can take it basically uh, this looks like a endometrioma on the ultrasound exactly which ovarian cyst with internal echos and a granular appearance uh, which uh, you described and this in this size is uh, 5 cm yes yeah it is so spicy. yeah and she has not been operated previously no i like to uh, plan for a surgery for this patient for endometriosis and being a primary surgery this should be the best surgery what we look at for a case of endometriosis so uh, a pre uh, surgical investigation in the form of antral amh levels should be undertaken and the patient should be uh, counseled regarding the loss of reserve in some cases where uh, some endometriomas can be adherent to the cortex and this can result in poor results later on so all this needs to be counseled and i think immediately after surgery post surgical amh levels and posting the patients for maybe uh, a hyper stimulation with iui protocol would be better than waiting her for a natural uh, conception that would my my plan uh, uh, do you think would you like to uh, still go ahead with the surgery if she's got a lower amh or would you do her first and then go ahead with the surgery with some adonic yeah. yeah so if her amh levels are low and uh, she has already had a, a infertility duration of 4 years in this case then definitely my plan of line action of line would change and in such patients i'll go for stimulation pick up and maybe before transfer we can plan a uh, surgery for her if the reserve is very low like we have poor over in reserve amh level okay. one less than 1.1 yeah so the message should go clearly that we have to do the amh and afc first and in case it is low we go ahead with the sandwich technique which is stimulation first prezol then either you operate give gnrh agonist and then go ahead with an fet now on surgery you have already found that it's a moderate endometriosis which you treat surgically there are patent tubes so now would you go ahead with an iui or an ivf directly or what is your cut off to for an iui or an ivf 
in such cases? I think let Nitin answer, Dr. Nitin, you can answer this. Can you hear us? Uh, oh, unmute yourself. Nitin, sir, uh, you are muted. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, we can hear you now. Uh, oh, Nitin, no. uh, can you... Oh, sir, you are still unmuted. Can you unmute? unmute yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then I'll appreciate if you ask me the same question again. Okay, sir, I would... Uh, you want to go to the previous slide? Yeah, please. Okay. Yes, sir. So basically, it's a uh, unilateral endometrium of five centimeter, and she has never undergone a, a kind of a, a surgery before. Primary subfertility of four years, and she has a severe dysmenorrhea. So, uh, if it's normal semen parameters, yes. Yeah, sir. and and uh, um, already Nilesh has mentioned that uh, he liked to go for surgery, and during surgery it was a moderate endometriosis. So you have done the surgery, and you have found that the tubes are patent. So how will you proceed in? Uh, what you will exactly advise her, whether IUR, IVF, or something else? Nitin, sir, I think he's lost connection. Okay, I think uh, maybe Mamta, you can uh, proceed. Yeah, thanks, Kundan. So, uh, yes, basically, uh, right now, if the surgery has been done, her AMH is good, you have cleared, done a very good first line surgery with patent tubes. She's young, 30 years old. So I would not mind trying a few cycles of IUI, but definitely controlled ovarian hyperstimulation with IUI would not advise her to try naturally. And always stimulation with uh, combined with IUI because it's already been, you know, there's enough literature for us to know that once you have done a surgery, going in for the COH plus IUI is going to give you much better pregnancy rates compared to trying naturally or compared to just doing a stimulation without an IUI. So it would be a COH with IUI for me. Of course, I mean, if the scenario, I just, one thing is that uh, Nilesh mentioned that he would do an AMH immediately post-surgery. I don't know if I got that correct, but uh, most of the times immediately post-surgery, the AMH would probably be a little low. So if you've seen a good AMH with good antral follicle count, only a unilateral endometrioma and you've done a good surgery, definitely I would try an IUI before recommending an IVF to her. Okay. Amol, what would be your cutoff for the number of IUIs and when would you like to shift for IVF in this patient? If, if her AMH is uh, above 1.2, her, uh, her uh, antral follicle count was good, then definitely three cycles of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation with IUI. Uh, if uh, three cycles of IUI are failing, then definitely we'll proceed for IVF. Uh, if the AMH is again on the lower side, then definitely I would be a uh, uh, little more uh, pro of going for IVF earlier. Okay. All right. So I think it should be very clear that any endometrioma of size, maybe three centimeter, you could take for an operative and the first surgery should be the best and the last surgery in cases of endometriosis. Now, finally, this couple agrees to go in for an ART after two more years and you had operated her for the first time. Now the pelvic scan shows a recurrent endometrioma of six centimeter. Pankaj, sir, you can take this if you're there. Pankaj, yeah, sir. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, see, uh, uh, regarding the first uh, uh, answer, if the AMH is good, probably I would go after the surgery, I would go with the Luprite Epo injections. And maybe depending on to the grade of the endometriosis, one injection or three injections. And after uh, some time, I will go with the ovarian stimulation with IUI. Because then that would definitely help her with AMH. If AMH is good and AFC is also okay. And if the other these factors are not in our favor, then probably I will directly go with the IVF. Um, can, I, can I make yeah, a comment? Yes. Can I make a comment, moderators? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I think uh, we have evidence now to say that if you are planning an IUI and you have done a good surgery, and I agree with what Dilesh mentioned, is that doing the first surgery very well is extremely important. It is best not to delay a pregnancy and suppress her by giving her these luprides and better to go in for an IUI immediately after the laparoscopy. Yes, giving her uh, the lupride depots if you're planning her on an IVF using an ultra long down regulation protocol may be an option that you want to try. But probably if you're deciding for an IUI, it's best that she goes in for a controlled ovarian hyperstimulation post surgery rather than using the exactly. depots. Nilesh, you want I to would... add something? Uh, would you? Yeah, I think. Your mark six centimeter, or would you manage? I... Yeah, so I would like to add uh, to what Mamta Madam said. I agree with her that I would not uh, downregulate or will not use GnRH agonist in this patient okay. and prolong the treatment. And as Kundan said, said don't tell about the evidence, but ASHRAE evidence classically says that you should not use a preoperative or postoperative GnRH agonist protocol, uh, GnRH agonist for improving her fertility outcomes. If the patient has pain, only in those patients you can use the GnRH agonist protocol agonist for treating her pain. Uh, regarding the second line, uh, like if there is a recurrent of endometriosis, I would uh, be operating this patient again, as evidence clearly says that there will be no specific benefit of operating this patient. However, we will be delaying the treatment. So, so in this case, I would like to plan an IVF cycle for this patient. Uh, and uh, probably before transfer, again, I will use a GnRH uh, depot preparation before transferring to this patient. Okay, Nilesh, uh, would you uh, like to first do a stimulation pickup and then operate rather than operating yeah. and then going only, for a frozen ET, right? On, only if uh, I am planning an IVF for her. But if it was a primary surgery and her AMH levels were good. No, no, this is a recurrent endometrioma of 6 centimeters. She I won't operate. I won't operate her. I won't operate her for a recurrent endometriosis. I think I'll defer at this point because I think since you have already done a good surgery before and it's a recurrent endometrioma, I should go ahead with the stimulation because now we have planned our IVF, do the egg pickup, freeze them, give her GnRH antagonist depot, maybe one or two, and then go ahead with an FET. Yeah, I'm saying the same, Ashwini. So, yeah, she's, yeah, that's what, yeah, he said the same thing. I I you said that you'll operate her first. I'm so no, sorry. No, 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 no. no. I, I won't operate. Okay. And would you want to drain such an endometrioma, Nilesh? No, no, no. Not Ever? anytime. Even, even I won't touch the endometrioma on a pickup. You won't anytime uh, touch the endometrioma or drain endometrioma because you are risking the patient for a, a maybe abscess formation. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. Nitin, sir, yeah. Nitin sir, you wanted to add something regarding this case? Nitin sir, you'll have to unmute. Yeah. Yeah, Shuni, can I uh, audible now? Yeah. 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 Uh, I fully agree what uh, Nil Dr. Nilesh and Dr. Mamta said that it, everything depends on the basically our ovarian reserve and also depends on the tubal mm -hmm. status. In case if the patient is having a, if patient is having intact fallopian tubes and also if she is financially not affording, in that case I will definitely like to go for uh, IUI. I think I have probably missed again this. There's a problem with electricity over here, so let me again just uh, you can ask me the subsequent question then. Okay, Kundan, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, and would your management change in the same patient if she had bilateral endometrioma? She's 31 yeah. years old with a good semen analysis. These are huge bilateral endometriomas. This is a different case. So, Nitin said, how would the management change in a bilateral endometrioma? Uh, Dr. Ashwini here, if the patient, she is 31 years old uh, with bilateral endometrioma, I don't think there is any scope for... Uh, IUI or natural cycle, first of all. Second thing, her line of treatment again depends on her antral follicle count and <laughs> AMH level. If her antral follicle count is good and if she has not offered surgery earlier, then I will like to do first surgery and then subsequently go for IVF. Or as mentioned by you earlier, the sandwich therapy is also a good option for her. So here I will do IVF, subsequently go for the surgery, do proper removal of the endometrioma and subsequently go for frozen embryo transfer. 
Right. So, so my right. question to Pankaj, Ashwini one, uh, yeah. Pankaj, uh, uh, do you feel that presence of endometrium does affect the endometrial receptivity? Because this sandwich protocol, finally, we are operating before transfer because we want to also improve the endometrial receptivity. So do you feel that doing this surgery is actually really benefiting for endometrial receptivity improvement? No, basically, I never meant that I would do IVF with the sandwich protocol. Okay. I firstly, because the tube anatomy is okay, because if the anatomy is okay, so that means that the endometriosis is not very severe. And she has got endometrioma. I will operate endometrioma properly. And if I give nuclear depot, then, then usually what I have found is that the results are better off if we wait for two cycles or three cycles and the three months, because then the patient will have amenorrhea. And then they are okay with the IUI. But if you are talking about IVF, then I will directly stimulate her, uh, freeze the embryos and transfer her subsequently with the frozen embryos. Yes. So, Mantra, do you feel so, that it, it does yeah. affect into Can I make a comment? Yeah. So, thanks, Kundan. So, I just like to, I know you're saying that, you know, uh, uh, from your experience, but because it correlates with the studies, there's a very beautiful study where they did a pickup from a woman who has endometriosis and transferred those embryos in a woman without endometriosis and vice versa. And what they found is that the effect is more at the embryo quality rather than the implantation. If you have a pure, pure ovarian endometrioma or endometri, of course, if you have an adenomyosis, which is present along with your endometriosis, then your implantation and receptivity will get affected. But for a pure, just isolated endometrioma, probably it's more going to affect your embryos and because of your oocyte quality, rather than the uh, implantation. So the uh, what uh, comments you made, Manta, uh, can we take a meaning of this that suppose we have a good embryo, good quality embryo with us, frozen with us, and then we take a call of surgery. And after surgery, probably there is no need of down regulation if it is not affecting endometrial surgery. That is what your, can we do that like this or? But, but why would you do a surgery if pain is not a factor? Why would you do a surgery if you've already done an oocyte retrieval? Why what, would you do a you, surgery? You, for you, this if you would have done it for a pain, say you patient has a severe dysmenorrhea, you have done it for that purpose. So doing a down regulation post surgery, because now you are going to plan for a frozen embryo transfer. So after the surgery, there is no need of down regulation. Can we do that? Can we take a meaning of this? What is oh, your opinion? See, if there is a lot of pain, I would associate it also with some amount of adenomyosis, even if you know it's not very clearly visible, especially sometimes you can only see a small endometrial cyst, which is going into the myometrium uh, on any, any kind of even the slightest suspicion that there it is associated, I would definitely down regulate. Dr. Kundan, I would like to add one thing is when the pain is very severe, the uh, endometriosis, and especially if it is bilateral, then it is bound to be very severe endometriosis. And endometriosis is known to be a chronic inflammatory condition, and it does, rele uh, does release uh, certain uh, various factors which affect the implantation, and endometrial receptivity does affect it with moderate to severe endometriosis. So if we down-regulate using a GNRH agonist for two to three months, and do a sandwich therapy, then always the endometrial receptivity would be quite better in such uh, moderate to severe endometriosis cases. Yes, I yeah. agree with Amol. Moderate to severe, definitely you would give a down regulation. Dr. Mamta, when you said that the embryo quality would be hampered, so you meant that the oocyte quality is not good in patients of endometriosis? Yes. Okay. I, I would like to ask uh, one question here to maybe all the panelists. Can I ask? No, like, you are not allowed. Only moderator can ask questions. <laughs> so I'm trying to raise one question. <laughs> Maybe I can put it other way that uh, even endometrioma, uh, presence of endometrioma itself will classify the endometriosis as grade three, according to the current statistics. So are we going to consider it as a moderate endometriosis or a severe endometriosis? Because it is a bilateral endometriosis in this case. So I, I think it itself indicates that it is a moderate to severe endometriosis. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's right. That's right. 
so i think uh, point you are trying to make it's a mod uh, uh, endometrial is already in looking at the history so yes that is right that is a moderate uh, scenario and that is why that sandwich protocol works better in this kind of scenario uh, we'll proceed to the case number 2 now we have a, a situation where a 34 years woman having a primary subfertility and she has been married since 5 years uh in her menstrual cycle uh, she has a regular cycle she is bleeding adequately and she does have a painful menstruation husband semen analysis does show a normal parameters like count and motility uh, hsg was done a uh, uh, couple of years back and it was showing a patent normal tubes now when a transvaginal scan was done during that visit uterus was uh, antiverted slightly bulky not very big but endometrial thickness was 10 mm and then we found out as you can see in the picture because we are talking about ultrasound and ultrasound always gives us very clear idea in the first visit itself that what can be the probable pathologies we are coming across so it is deviated entirely due to presence of intramural fibroid which you can see it marked with uh, markers of size of around 3.5 to 4 cm in a posterior wall of the uterus both ovaries showed a adequate reserve 8 to 10 antral follicle on each side now before coming to us she has already underwent three controlled ovarian hyperstimulation cycles with gonadotropins with iui cycles but there was no success now looking at this history factors there is a one intramural fibroid of size of around 3.5 to 4 cm so my first question uh, we'll start with uh, amol uh, what might be the reason for iui failure can we say that yes this fibroid is the only reason for failures or would you like to go into other things in details what you will see and then you can say that okay these were fine then uh, fibroid might be the reason so uh, fi fibroid may not be the only reason of iui failure it can be okay. one of the factor causing uh, iui failure because uh, it is distorting the endometrial cavity also it is going to distort the pelvic anatomy to certain extent and maybe the tube ovarian relationship is not uh, properly maintained so we don't know about the tube ovarian relationship So, uh, but that yeah. if we remove the fibroid, yes. will improve her chances of success in IUI because reserve is good, analysis is good. Tubes she is already thirty-four, thirty-five year old, uh, yes. trying for five years for pregnancy. Already three cycles of IUI failed. Uh, I would uh, rather uh, be comfortable taking the patient or counseling them for an IVF cycle now. Uh, of course, uh, uh, she would require myomectomy. Uh, and uh, so my approach would be very clear uh, first is to go for an ovum pick up uh, do a formation of good blastocyst embryos and freeze the blastocyst do a myomectomy you are at least two cycles of gnrh analog and then transfer the uh, blastocyst embryos back into the uterus patch amol any advantage of having embryo in hand prior what are the advantages why you want to do that first embryo uh, freezing and then operate even if you if you want to operate in the first day first uh, you know as a priority and then you do ivf even that will suffice or do you feel some advantages are there you usually my concept is i try to make uh, keep the seeds in my hand and then prepare the soil and then sow okay. good seeds into the soil okay. to achieve okay. pregnancy nitin do you uh, still follow the same or you have some different opinion no i i differ what dr amul said here i will rather like to do a laparoscopic removal and at the time of laparoscopy we will get the advantage to assess her pelvic structure tubo ovarian relationship and concomitant presence of any other pathology absolutely now, yes so now once that is done now we have got a perfectly normal uterus with perfectly normal fallopian tube here the doing iui is a altogether different ball game and i suppose the chances of pregnancy outcome will be far better so this will be my approach okay uh, now uh, a question to pankaj if you have to plan a myomectomy now it's a three point have you have looked at the ultrasound picture uh, this is good to operate hysteroscopically or laparoscopically what is your uh, I, take on personally i will go laparoscopically okay because the chances of uh, endometrial damage would be less as i feel through the hysteroscopic myomectomy yeah because we if we look at the uh, picture of ultrasound uh, if we start digging it from hysteroscopically probably will end up in almost having a very thin endometrium in that area 
am i right uh, pankaj that is what is the more important worry yeah i think so yeah uh, so uh, nilesh uh, which fibroids you think that if i remove it in infertility couple or infertility patient which it will really help me to achieve or enhance the fertility maybe spontaneous conception maybe even improving the art results so which fibroid you want to remove yeah so i think any fibroid which is in, uh, in the cavity or indenting the cavity that is uh, type 0 1 and 2 according to the figo classification and type 3 fibroids especially which are near to the endometrium this can again like this fibroid which you have shown in the picture goes into the type 3 or type 4 which is intramural and indenting the cavity so anything uh, of this sort will be removed uh, also we have to think about the size of fibroid sometimes because if the size is more and even if that not indenting the cavity but during pregnancy this can increase in size and cause some problems during pregnancy like red degeneration and so so five sizes more than 5 cm you should be skeptical and removing them uh, even if they are not distorting the cavity but for infertility per se i would say that type 0 1 2 and probably 3 which are indenting the cavity okay mamta uh, uh, this what has pointed out that the fibroids which are touching to the cavity now they are not distorting so they are but touching to the cavity so what is the problem i mean exactly where the pathological uh, uh, significance comes when you decide that okay i want to operate so first you tell me whether you will operate if you want to operate why you want to operate where exactly it affects fertility yeah so actually i have been thinking through the discussion whether you know i would immediately operate this fibroid because it was very very minimally touching that endo it didn't seem to maybe i missed that outcome uh, you know i didn't see that picture properly but uh, any fibroid no. which distorts the uterine cavity i would remove it right now if you look at the uh, uh, the uh, uh, wall which is close to the cavity you can see that it is actually probably little not indenting but it is deviating, deviating. it is pushing the cavity so right. where you can see even the endometrium part which is close to fibroid is very thin uh, right so what you will do here yeah i see i think the pathogenesis is probably the hyperestrogenic condition and there's a lot of vascularity which gets pulled towards the fibroid when you have a fibroid and it can affect you know even the endometrial implantation and the endometrial vascularity in these conditions so i think that is also something that we need to keep in mind i agree with uh, uh, mamta and i think this was the study 2010 which we clearly said that endometrial hoxa 10 and 11 messenger rna expressions which are a very important part for uh, a good endometrial receptivity they are significantly decreased where you have a uterus with a submucosal fibroids and if you compare with the uh, controls and if a patient who is having a intramural myomas which are away from the cavity but there is a definite affection Uh, and there are uh, good studies available they say that if the fibroid is touching or deviating to the uh, cavity uh, then probably there is a less uh, receptivity in the adjacent endometrium and thus affect the implantation rate now this is the classification diagram and uh, uh, for viewers this is uh, what we were discussing about we are having clear cut uh, guidelines that to remove 0 1 and 2 but about 3 is the always controversial 3 and 4 whether we should remove or not to remove and uh, as we know that fibroids they do affect the fertility by having a chronic endometrial inflammation and uh, uh, having a increased uterine contractility abnormal vascularization and even the abnormal local endocrine pattern even the space occupying intrauterine fibroid does uh, interfere into sperm transport and embryo implantation and these are the mechanisms so uh, coming to nitin again Uh, how do you classify submucosal fibroid and uh, how the ultrasound helps you to identify this kind of classifications i think i'll pass this question to other panelists sure uh, uh, dr. Piri, uh, dr kunda amol amol you can yes. answer so during classifying uh, submucosal fibroid as uh, you have uh, shown in your previous slide the figo classification Hello. 0 1 and 2 but uh, that is according to the site of the fibroid Hello. but we have to also look huh. at other uh, consideration that is the size of the fibroid then the tethering which it is causing to oh, the endometrial oh, oh. junction and second thing is uh, whether uh, how much portion of it is attached uh, or occupying how much amount of the cavity uh, less than 1/3 1/3 to 2/3 or more than 2/3 
again we have to also uh, take into consideration whether it is affecting the lateral wall because all this is going to be taken in our last mark score or the step w classification scoring which will help us to tell whether you can do it hysteroscopically or laparoscopically or it will be in a single sitting or you might require a second sitting so you it will help us in uh, not only classifying but also prognosis for the patient and also counseling the patient accordingly uh, regarding uh, the management right mamta uh, yes. i want to know from you uh, uh, some few points about uh, which fibroid even in submucosal you will think that okay i will remove but i will not touch probably they may not even have so much significant effect um no see if it is a submucous fibroid a clear submucous fibroid i would probably remove it always kundan except if it is only very very mildly into then most of its part is in intramural if it is a very tiny fibroid with more than 50 60 part being intramural with only a very slight protrusion into the cavity which is uh, you know what they say is 2 0 1 i would definitely but 2 uh, maybe maybe not uh, you know if you are already doing a hysteroscopy right then you would definitely try and get it out but maybe if it is a type 2 with very minimal protrusion and you are not planned a hysteroscopy she's already gone through it before then it might be you know um, you could probably try and do the embryo i'm talking of an art procedure over right here. nilesh nilesh if it is like a type 2 fibroid which is it's not more than 2 cm or it just 1 cm probably type 2 will you still uh, defer here that okay every time we remove or you will think of location or the past history i mean this is what i mean this is the scenario what you will do yeah so i think uh, there is a clear cut indication which we talked of so type 0 1 and 2 need to be removed before we plan a transfer and i would like to defer here with mamta madam Uh, that not to remove type two if you are not planned a surgery or we are already proceeded. I think this will affect our results if you are keeping the type two inside. However, while planning our surgery for type two, uh, we have to take into consideration the step W last mark classification and see the complexity of the procedure. Maybe we can plan a preoperative GnRH agonist for this patient uh, uh, depot preparation if the fibroid is larger enough. But if it is a two or less than two centimeter fibroid, this can be taken out in a single setting. Uh, and if the fibroid is little bit larger and you are not able to complete it in the same setting then probably uh, you can do a second setting for this patient yeah so you know what nilesh i agree see sometimes what happens is you are in a dilemma because like for example a patient has just done a hysteroscopy sometimes such patients do come to you where they have just done a hysteroscopy and you see a very tiny speck over there somewhere and uh, you know you're not very really sure whether you should subject her to a hysteroscopy again you know that you have good number of embryos then you have the dilemma of whether you would immediately subject her to a hysteroscopy be remove this very tiny of course if it's a large fibroid definitely the you know you don't have a question mark you would go ahead and remove it but if not if it's very very tiny then you have this dilemma of whether you subject her to a hysteroscopy again like i said if you're doing a hysteroscopy definitely remove it but Dr. whether Pundan. you know to subject right. her to one more hysteroscopy i would have a dilemma right i think i think we uh, come to the conclusion that we have to think of location of the fibroid we have to take a consideration about the size of the fibroid and of course we have to take into consideration about the previous treatment failures as well as her obstetric history is there any miscarriage in the past and does it because of the fibroid ruling out other reasons so i think uh, especially when it comes to type 2 i think if when it is comes to very tiny uh, small fibroids even if they are tiny to type i mean type 2 we have to take into consideration these factors and then take a decision so uh, not like a blanket rule for even tiny fibroids now uh, pankaj uh, which investigation uh, amol i'll come come back to you yes. uh, pankaj uh, which investigation will you like to do before decision of myomectomy now probably you have a 3 cent uh, 2.5 cm uh, submucosal type 1 fibroid but uh, any specific investigation before you plan to remove it firstly i would uh, definitely see what is her anti follicle count and uh, afc because if that is on the lower side then probably i will convince her or counselor for ivf home pick up and freeze the embryos and then probably i will go with yes. the myomectomy 
yes i want to ask any any investigation which will help you to operate so uh, is i mean not for other uh, fertility factors but any investigation which will help you while doing a surgery or before doing a surgery to make it more perfect nitin maybe mri i would advise and to okay. know where exactly and what exactly it is but most of the times i have seen that mri also do not tell us anything a sonosalpingogram may help sometimes if okay. you want to but of course if you have a very good ultrasound you may not need it especially with a 3d ultrasound exactly. but so uh, sonosalpingogram I, uh, yeah if you can look at this kind of pictures where you can so much easily you get to know exactly the extent of myometrial penetration by that fibroid like this in particular or sometimes even this where you know you have a very deeply seated uh, fibroid where uh, excision is going to take more time even this particular fibroid where you know doing hysteroscopy is going to be very difficult because its location is at fundus and the loop which is not uh, going to allow you for a easy excision of this fibroid so i think what we call as a fibroid mapping because that's what i wanted to uh, elicit from my panelists that if before myomectomy doing a mapping of your fibroid which is going to help you to decide whether it is approachable hysteroscopically or it's going to be easy laparoscopically and not only that how much deep extent of fibroid is there now the evidence which is saying especially uh, this 2018 that type 3 fibroids which we are talking about touching to the cavity they exert a negative impact on the rates of implantation clinical pregnancy and live birth in patients undergoing ivf but they do not significantly increase the clinical miscarriage rate so the deleterious uh, impact was remarkable in women with a type 3 fibroids with more than 2 cm in transverse or sagittal diameter so you whenever it comes to type 3 and if it is more than 2 cm the evidence is in favor that we should operate to improve the reproductive outcome even if you have a intramural fibroid not touching to the cavity but the size is more than 4 cm i think there is a good evidence and uh, uh, that that we must operate before ivf or icc so uh, i uh, ashwini you can take this further sorry kundan any 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 yeah. panelists any experience on using ulipristal and avoiding a surgery and then trying to reduce the size and then doing i think it's a work of lot of patience and i think when there is a younger age group patient and you're just waiting for an iui cycle with a fibroid which is not indenting the cavity but still there maybe you can try again it's it's similar like a uh, drugs if they are inter going to interfere with fertility right. is the question whether we should offer it or no so i think uh, time is going to be a major uh, factor because even if it is fibroid and you want to reduce the volume of the fibroid you need minimum six months to one year course so i think probably you know uh, it's very difficult something also very now there is uh, yeah we won't go into it but there is a study by donors where they have given 12 12 weeks at two months apart and significant decrease and then yes, gone course. ahead I, and they claim a agree. very good result but i do yeah, agree no but the time is the big problem okay the time is the big problem but i like the, the four courses three months apart and giving one one month so i think medical line of treatment uh, if your couple is ready to wait for so long i think uh, fair enough that's uh, only after you have the seeds of course if you are doing an art and want to avoid a surgery not without that i think the oocytes will get angry if we repeatedly tell them seeds okay call them seeds <laughs> <laughs> i'm just trying to <laughs> get to a double cell okay. very interesting case now this is yeah. a 32 year old lady who's been married for 5 years and she's had a history of secondary infertility she's always had boh repeated miscarriages so uh, this is her scan uh, her obstetric history was she had a gestation in a left horn with a missed abortion at 8 weeks a dne was done again gestation in the left horn 6 weeks dne done she was a known case of bicornuate uterus and on per speculum a single cervix was seen now what happened this patient when uh, we had this conclusion that this is a bicornuate uterus now as we say ultrasound is best to diagnose um, uterine malformation with 3d and even the 2d and ultrasound is easy to diagnose many this condition but what happened after two months while uh, we were doing other investigation she complained of pain in vagina and that occurs during every menses so uh, 
uh, we just happened to be on second day she was with us and we did a sonography and we noticed some blood collection in that right vaginal wall on that day particularly and when we saw perspiculum again we saw some old blood coming through that tiny opening on that right vaginal fornix near that area so uh, we decided to do a examination under anesthesia and we noticed there that there is a another kind of a cervix whose external loss was opening into that blind pouch you can look into this that this was the opening here and there was blood collection into this pouch so uh, you know what we did is that we tried to uh, dilate this opening and we cut even some part of it and then we realized that the blood drain out from that pouch so then we excised that particular part completely and then we realized that there is always there is another cervix in that pouch so uh, it was then finalized on after that examination under anesthesia that it's not a bicornuit it is a uterine diadelphis now probably uh, this diagnosis would have been very easily picked up if 3d ultrasound uh, uh, has been done and we would have picked up very well on that particular second day because there is a blood collection and the pouch is distended with the blood so uh, but anyway uh, we did this examination under anesthesia and we were all sure that they need ivf because of the factor of oligospermia and then we did the same day after that excision of uh, septum we did a hysteroscopy and uh, this was a, a, a picture this was a right horn and uh, this was a left horn picture now left horn uh, as we have seen in that previous one picture there was a, a protruding fibroid in that left horn uh we thought of that maybe this is the reason for her previous two missed abortions and right on that way was quite okay uh, not many uh, pathologies or no protrusion or volume wise looks quite okay now this was our office hysteroscopy so my question to panelists uh, maybe uh, nilesh you can take it uh, now suppose you have to do ivf now she has a sitting left uh, submucosal fibroid right on is normal you have excised the septum now what you will do you have two options whether you operate uh, uh, that fibroid and remove it hysteroscopically do a transfer on the left side because already left horn is got a proven uh, receptivity or you want to do a right horn transfer and forget about the fibroid what you will do uh, nilesh i probably feel that uh, the right hand horn is normal i will go for a right transfer in the right horn and check for the right horn if it is able to continue the pregnancy because already we had Uh, repeated abortion some miscarriages in the left horn and it also has a fibroid so better to go in the right horn if which looks normal on hysteroscope okay However, amol uh, amol think... will you will you do the same thing or you want to defer here yeah, uh, first we have to also check uh, how the right horn is uh, endometrium is its vascularity its thickness and uh, the uh, endometrial myometrial interface Uh, once i am satisfied that the right horn uh, volume is good the endometrium is good the vascularity is good then definitely a single embryo transfer in the right horn uh, is going to be a good option right i think that's also a very valid point that you will assess because those parameters uh, so you know uh, we really did this all in this patient and uh, fortunately she has a very good volume of the endometrial growth in both the horns uh, only thing is that left horn had a protruding fibroid and we decided to do a right uh, horn transfer now uh, dr nitin uh, as you see that the cervix is very flush to vagina very difficult to locate this now do you uh, i mean come across some difficulty in him doing a embryo transfer right and left because not very classical cervix uh, we can see in this they are all flush with the vagina sometimes you have to trace where is the uh, external loss so do you plan this embryo transfer under anesthesia or it's okay you will try without anesthesia first nitin uh, in a covid era definitely i will not like to give, uh, do it under anesthesia but let's put a hypothetical situation that we are having a non covid area here definitely i will like to do it under anesthesia number 1 number 2 i will do it uh, on a full bladder with a sonography guide and number 3 i will keep a metal catheter metal embryo transfer catheter in uh, for my, in case of difficult transfer uh, these are the few thing, uh, things which i will definitely like to do uh, in this particular patient but my question is uh, uh, why in a normal situation if her right horn is normal why she has not conceived in that horn and why she kept uh, becoming pregnant in the left horn 
So that is probably that uh, picture, especially. Kind of a kind of a there was vaginal very septum. tiny opening there, like only a sinus. Yeah, it was a longitudinal, probably vaginal septum, and left fornix because of repeated intercourse was well dilated, and uh, only the sinus forceps could go through that opening. That was the uh, on, that much small opening was there. Probably that is why she might not conceive because sometimes we do see that the vagina is very dilated and the left uh, the uh, cervix which is there in that vagina, and we see the pregnancy repeatedly happen on that side. Ashwini, I think you can take ahead with the next case. Move ahead with the next case. Yeah. Uh, so this is a typical picture of a primary subfertility patient, 33 year old. She's always got a regular cycles. Uh, this is a first consultation to me. So this is a 2D picture. This is a 3D picture. So I would like to know from you, uh, what do you think when you see such a picture? What would be the probable diagnosis? Ashwini specific. Okay. So it looks like poly. Yeah, it looks, looks like an endometrial polyp. Okay, it's All quite right. a large one though. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's filling the entire cavity. So I would like to know from you all, how would your management differ if this is a patient who is going ahead with an IUI or this is a patient who is going ahead with an IVF? Which polyps right. would you like to remove? So I think if it's the incidental diagnosis, uh, then maybe a smaller size polyps you can uh, leave less than one centimeter. So there's a a difference of opinion whether you leave a sub centimeter polyp or whether you remove it. But it is said that if it is an incidental finding, if the patient is for an actual conception or you want to wait for expected management, then you may not remove these polyps. But if you are planning an IVF cycle, all polyps I think should be removed. And if you are planning an IUI cycle in this patient specifically, we'll go for a polypectomy and then plan a cycle. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So polyps also, okay, planning. This yes. is quite a big polyp. It needs to be removed. Now, uh, Nilesh, I have a question because you raised one uh, important point that if the patient is going for a spontaneous conception and accidentally you diagnose even such kind of polyp, will you remove this polyp before she goes back for a natural try or you will leave it like that? So Nilesh, I, I just talked I just talked about sub-centimetric polyps. So if it is less than one centimeter and incidental diagnosis, then I leave it. Otherwise, polyps more than one centimeter, which this polyps looks like, I will go for a polypectomy and then allow her natural conception. Okay, Pankaj, uh, uh, do you uh, accept that below one centimeter or do you feel that it is below 0.5? No, no, if, uh, uh, if I'm uh, detecting the polyp accidentally, I think I will wait for the natural conception and then uh, I will definitely wait for some time. Okay, I'm an old time so Nitin? Yeah, in her case, she being a 33 years old lady. I don't think I will like to wait. I will first uh, do the polypectomy and followed by along with her AFC and AMH level and her husband count, I will take a call how to proceed. No, but suppose you have 8 by 7 millimeter polyp in the uterine cavity. She never mm -hmm. conceived, she never had a history of miscarriage and she's mm -hmm. trying for a pregnancy. Will you remove that polyp or no? No, no. no. 7 Again, by 8 millimeter, you won't remove it? Looking at her age, I think I will go ahead and I'll remove that polyp. Yeah, the, the whole point is that the evidence says that the polyp, which is below 0.5 centimeter, you may not touch it. But above 0 0.5 centimeter, it is associated with an increased risk of miscarriage and even the implantation failure. And that is why, why do we remove before every IVF? Because we are planning for implantation and pregnancy where we don't want this kind of risk. So that risk is not just increased with IVF, it also increases with the spontaneous conception. So I think that if we go with the literature, uh, 0 0.5 centimeter and below, smaller polyps than that, I think you may not touch it because they do not interfere in continuation. But above 0 0.5 is something which we have to look into it. Yes, Ashwini. Uh, yeah, can you just... Uh, I would also like to ask any of the panelists. So this is our uh, hysteroscopic picture. When we did the hysteroscopic, it was the polyp and we actually removed it. And as you can all see that ACOG also recommends hysteroscopic polypectomy as the gold standard. So indications for polyp removal could be infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, and the surgical resection is the best. See it and remove it rather than doing a blind curettage. 
I would like to ask my panelists, uh, what would you do if you see a similar kind of a colic when the patient is on stimulation and it is her day eight or day nine, but you haven't seen this picture before when she came for a day two baseline scan. If there's a small colic, uh, one millimeter or a 0.51 on her day eight, day nine of stimulation. Yeah, I think hyperestrogenism uh, during stimulation, specifically in uh, ART cycles, you may come across you know, such smaller polyps, uh, yeah. usually till 0.5 centimeter. But if, before transferring the, uh, to this patient, if the polyps are more than 0.5 centimeter, again, I would like to put in a scope before transferring in this patient. And if it was a less, very, very small polyp, less than 0.5 centimeter, I will again like to evaluate in the next cycle before transferring. So I'll freeze the embryos. Uh, plan a FET for her and in the next cycle if the polyp is still there then go for a polypectomy and any polyp more than 0.5 centimeter I will straight away go with a hysteroscopy post menstrual cycle. So if you see smaller polyps so you need not worry on the day 8, 9 or 10 of stimulation it would generally go by your if it is because of uh, what other investigation would you like to do more than a 3D ultrasound you have already done a 3D you have seen a polyp something else that you would like to add on Sonosalpingogram again, myself. I think a good yes, sonosalpingogram would give you a very clear picture of the location. You could. Uh... But actually, my question is she is under IVF stimulation. So Sorry? during the, she is under IVF stimulation. Huh? So during stimulation, would you like to do sonosalpingography? No, 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 no. This is a no. different picture. Oh. No, just... no, even the case history was not that she is undergoing any stimulation. No, I was just asking just a... in case if you see such a polyp on stimulation. The previous oh. case was a baseline second day. So we all agree that a polypectomy needs to be done and a good assessment is very important. When you do a 2D scan, remember to always do a 3D scan and in a minute you would get a diagnosis of polyp. We'll move to the next case, Kundan. Yeah, so uh, just look at the uh, ultrasound picture and tell us that exactly what assessment is going on and uh, what I mean, what uh, inference we are uh, getting it from it. So we can look at this one kind of uh, transvaginal scan picture uh, doing a follicular measurement and uh, then the color Doppler was uh, put and then we saw this kind of vascularity around uh, follicle. So already, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sonal has mentioned about and talked about it in very much in details. My question is to Amol that uh, yes. do you regularly uh, do this kind of things in IUI treatments and what exactly you follow if you are doing regularly? Especially when we are uh, deciding about the trigger when uh, mm -hmm. follicle size is above 14 mm and in IUI cycle, the timing of trigger is very important. Because if your trigger is not proper, then you are going to uh, land up into uh, luteinized unruptured follicle or uh, improper ovulation and then your UI results won't be better. So uh, for timing of trigger, using of uh, Doppler flows is uh, very important. It will help you out uh, giving proper uh, trigger. So we have to uh, put in the Doppler, see at least the vascularity if the follicle is having good 3 4 uh, vascularity in the circumference, then that is the right time to trigger. If you are going to go into the indices, then the resistive index, if it is low, around 0.4 or 0.42, then it is the right time to trigger. And the peak systolic velocity should be more than 10 centimeter per second. So these are the cutoffs which we can use. Uh, either any two of them will help us to uh, uh, time our trigger properly. Right. I want to ask you one question that suppose uh, he rightly mentioned that about timing of SCG for uh, trigger, but uh, does this kind of vascularity, uh, if it is very low, does it says that the follicle quality is not going to be good? Is it, can we draw those interfer uh, in a, I mean, interpretation from these kind of findings? If it is a very less perifollicular vascularity, Pankaj? Uh, I think I will go ahead and try with what happens because ultimately the technicalities and the way we keep the probes and because basically I am not that expert in all these dopplers and all. So I would okay. still keep a uh, trigger and see the results. Okay. Uh, Mamka, do you, uh, do you, uh, yeah. I mean, what's your opinion in this kind of 
scenario does it help you to predict so, about the outside quality um well uh, see i have not uh, i don't have any personal experience because you will know usaid quality only in your ivf cycles yes. so you know yes. you have to know that particular flow in that particular follicle and assess your usaid against that particular follicle but yes studies have definitely shown that you know when you have a high resistance index and a low psv the oxygenation is not good and these correlate with your biochemical and the physiological and functional aspect of the follicle not just the anatomical and therefore when you have oocytes from this you either get immature or the quality of the embryos is not good so there is i think a study by pritz uh, you know which says that they have definitely correlated so this is in terms of the quality in terms of iui i think dopplers are excellent to decide when to time and especially if the psv is very high it could indicate a very imminent rupture and you may want to even plan your iui earlier than 36 hours maybe immediately the next day so this will definitely and if you can utilize this in your iui settings your iui results will be much better thank you mamta for bringing those very important points of perifollicular uh, blood flow assessment and uh, 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 so again a film for all of you ashwini so uh, you have to tell us that what is the probable diagnosis so i'll just on mind if you see such kind this is a baseline day to scan of a patient who's come with history of infertility a uh, irregular endometrium not looking very good so nilesh what do you can you describe this scan while the scan is going on the flow is also uh, not very great yeah, yeah i think uh, it's not a regular uh, pattern of endometrium the uh, pattern is little bit showing like it has uh, adhesions and uh, maybe uh, we can expect adhesions in this patient and we can have plan a 3d along with this 2d ultrasound which will give us a more correct picture at the fundus we can see some a uh, solitary focal lesion maybe it can if we can we have to rule out a uh, focal myometrial contraction also in this kind of patients if you can see a round uh, focal hypoechoic lesion just above the arrow so this is what you are trying to say yeah yeah that one yeah but that so just the shadow of that's, that's just the shadow no above that above that so above that there is a yeah this one yes yeah so this can that's be the, either that's hmm. outside can, the outside the this uterus can be outside the uterus this can either be a focal myometrial contraction or then we have to also rule out adenomyosis whether we are whenever we are getting such shadows but more so looks like a thin endometrium and we have to rule out rule out adhesions that's what i feel yeah absolutely i think the whole uh, intention of putting this video is you know uh, sometimes we do see a very regular contour of endometrium but when you have a very irregular contour of endometrial uh, uh, volume i think uh, something and where where you have a very thin growth and very sometimes you see a 6 mm thickness in the mid cavity but the fundus is showing only 3.5 4.5 and it is irregular so i think the diagnosis can be easily picked up on ultrasound that it is a intrauterine adhesions and an anilesh has rightly said i think even taking a 3d uh, picture will help us to quickly pick it up sometimes even you can just put some fluid that is sonosalpingography and you can see that the fluid is showing some kind of filling defect i mean the vertical echoic bands also in that fluid so can be easily picked up by even sonosalpingography so i think ultrasound is helping us to uh, pick up so many pelvic pathologies easily we don't need to uh, do some mri or ct or kind of uh, hysteroscopy just to diagnose them yes for a corrective measures it is i do agree with it now this patient on second day of menses 29 years old woman having a primary subfertility married since 3 years her cycles are irregular they are unovulatory looks like painless ultrasound was showing a bilateral pco it's in the previous ultrasound and when we were doing her scan on second day it shows a finding as as you can uh, see in the video and uh, so what is probably your diagnosis here and how you will confirm your diagnosis now this patient has not gone undergone any treatment till yet 
and uh, uh, not many ultrasound reports are available with us but the size of the fibroid looks quite uh, sorry size of the cyst looks quite a big size so what is your probable thing i mean how you will plan whether it is pathological whether it is just a, a simple fu functional cyst how you will plan so amol you can take this so basically it is a, a thin walled ovary and uh, uh, important thing is also to look at the vascularity uh, and also follow up the uh, patient after 2 weeks or 3 weeks by repeat scan to see whether the cyst is was just functional and it disappears or it is persistent uh, initial diagnosis will be like a simple uh, cyst or a uh, uh, can say a, a luteinized unruptured follicle maybe okay any any other test nitin you will do or some kind of you will prescribe anything to see and then whether it disappears will you do that or what you will do how you will proceed with this first of all i would like to see her sonography properly i have not seen the ovary whether it is a ovarian cyst or is a para ovarian cyst that i would like it to is a ovarian cyst uh, nitin it is, it is ovarian. ovarian yeah okay in that case um, as uh, amol said i will like to repeat her sonography after few days and if it persists then i will like to give a course of uh, oral contraceptive oc pills and see whether it is uh, regressing on its own or not right so i think if it is a simple follicular cyst just give one cycle of oral contraceptive pills and following months you won't see it or you will see the decompression or reduced size of the cyst but if it is kind of it is still persistent of 4 to 5 same size even after one or two cycle of oc pills what can be the other diagnosis nilesh still uh, it can be a persistent cyst uh, we can say and in this case we may have to think if oc one or two cycles have already been given uh, and uh, this we have to look at the symptoms of the patient if the patient is having any pain uh, because of distension and the size is slightly increasing uh, a slight risk of torsion also always remains because it is a 5 by 4 cm cyst if we can see the dimensions so we have to take a call regarding surgery and maybe a cystectomy for such kind of patients uh mamta can it be a cyst adenoma possible simple simple cyst adenoma because it has not disappeared is it possible it i of course it can be possible but you would see some telltale signs you know i mean uh, this looks like a simple cyst to me or at least on the sonography but i agree yeah. that if it does not uh, go away or disappear even after 3 months of continuous oral contraceptive pills then you may have to just look into it but i would be very reluctant still to go in for a surgery Great. If you are a young patient with no symptoms, so, yeah. I would like to ask you uh, if this would be the case of a patient on day two of IVF stimulation. If you see such a simple cyst unilaterally, what would you do? I mean, would we still go ahead with the stimulation, or would we? So he, he, no, I wouldn't. Not with a cyst of this size. What would you do? Aspirate, go ahead, send estradiol levels. No, I wouldn't aspirate. I mean, if I have seen her before, obviously you would have seen your IVF patients before, and obviously she wouldn't have had this cyst. So if she suddenly brings this up, I would just wait on her. All right. So you wouldn't go ahead with an aspiration. I wouldn't. Anybody who differs? Levels. Anybody who aspirates and starts the stimulation that day itself. So even if, if if it is persisting after uh, one or two cycles of oc pills and you want to go ahead with ivf uh, if estradiol levels are uh, below 50 then you can straight away proceed with your stimulation so uh, uh, everybody agrees that uh, even if we have 4 to 5 cm cyst in the that ovary even we start ivf stimulation that ovary is going to uh, response normally it's not going to be under response from that side Everybody agrees with that this statement. Yes. Or anybody uh, differs uh, here? Pankaj, I, I will not. I will not go for a stimulation in such kind of patients where the size is five centimeter. Yeah, would so would I. But it's not disappearing. No, no it's, it's not disappearing. Say it that it's not going to disappear. It need if you surgically remove the cyst wall, then only it's going to disappear. But it is there. Yeah. Now yeah, you so want to I'll do IVF. i will go for a surgery if it's the size is 5 more than 5 cm she is symptomatic i will definitely go for a surgery and then go for a ivf for this patient pankaj your opinion 
no I, uh, if the if the cyst is there and there is no other type means if i am not suspecting cyst at all because normal follicular cyst or a corpus luteum cyst would spontaneously resolve that is yes. what is being said that they yes. resolve in two, two months yeah. if But it, it is not resolve uh, if it is not resolving then probably you have to look what type of a cyst it is and then probably plan the management like you said it can be some cyst adenoma or something else then probably we need to operate and go ahead of course if you want to go ivf you always consider doing amh and all those things but then if that everything is normal then probably look into other matters what the cyst is then take a call as to how to proceed further that is what i would say uh kundan can you make it earlier Uh, yes i think now we are at the last okay. case and last slide okay, okay. so uh, this is the picture on the ultrasound uh, uh, nitin can you describe the picture what you can see it here some labeling is also there yeah. can you, uh, can you describe it to something yeah so what are those classical signs which can help you to say that it is yes 100% it is uh, hydrosulfings on the ultrasound number 1 uh, it is a big in size second is crochet uh, appearance is there and uh, it looks away from the ovary so it is not a ovarian structure so most probably it seems to it seems to be a hydrosulfing right so uh, mamta uh, if you see this picture now uh, look at the history she had a three cycles of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation failure and uh, all those three cycles all trans abdominal scan follicular monitoring was done and uh, she came to us for a second opinion and we noticed this kind of picture now uh, her cycles are regular her hus husband semen analysis is normal but she is married for 7 years 34 years woman now just quickly what you will do will you operate on this patient will you leave behind and go ahead with further management no uh, see uh, if she has been going through controlled ovarian stimulation and iui with such kind of tube she is definitely not going to conceive in the first place so if she has a very good amh on her ovarian reserve uh, i would definitely go ahead and operate on this patient try and understand what the pathology is inside it will also give you an understanding of what is the reason behind the hydrosalpings in the first place it could be tuberculosis akt whatever it is you need to manage that before you put her through further treatment right so uh, what is your opinion uh, 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 nilesh that will you do a salping it tommy or you will just do a proximal tubal occlusion what is your choice first choice i think a sulfingectomy whenever it's possible if there are no adhesions it's better to go for a sulfingectomy pre ivf sulfingectomy because if you do a proximal tubal occlusion sometimes this hydrosulfings remain as such and they uh, tend to increase because they are not draining into the intermetal cavity and because of this the patient will experience pain later on and you may land up in a second surgery so i feel going for a sulfingectomy is the preferable option in such kind of patients but if you are not able to do a sulfingectomy because of the adhesions the tube is buried in a tube ovarian mass in such patients you can go for a proximal tubal occlusion either laparoscopically or if not possible uh, hysteroscopic occlusion right so nitin suppose on x ray you have on hsg you have a minimal dilated tube but when you do ultrasound you don't see any hydrosulfings or fluid filled uh, uh, these areas will you still think and decide that okay i should go for laparoscopy and confirm uh in part, especially in this particular patient since she is 34 years yes i will definitely like to do not only laparoscopy but also hysteroscopy on her so right. that we yeah, will get the opportunity to assess her endometrial cavity also and if she is as dr mamta said if she is having some uh, tuberculosis we might get some adhesions in the uh, in the uterine cavity as well Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, a very small quote uh, before all of we you know disperse. We are here to add what we can to the life, not to get what we can from the life. So we always want to add you know, something into ourselves which can be taken from our life. So uh, all the knowledge what we gathered today from all our experts, I think it's going to be a very valuable in our infertility practice. and uh, uh, ashwini you want to have some comments before we say thank you to them i would like to thank all my panelists they were excellent we had an excellent discussion thank you so much 
I think I'll hand over the speech to Prakash Kothare sir to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Kundar and Ashwini, for such a wonderful moderation. Thank you for thank inviting. You, yeah. thank, thank, thank you, Ashwini. Thank, thank you, Dilesh. Thank, thank you, Kundar. Thank you, Ashwini. POGS. It was wonderful, and it was wonderful oh, seeing you guys. I see All you. the panelists too. Granting us one credit point. Yeah, Prakash sir, are you there? Uh, I I want to have one. Prakash, sorry, one second. Uh, uh, on behalf of all of us, thanks to Dr. Harshad Parasnis, President, uh, Dr. Chaitanya Ganpule, and uh, Dr. Ashwini for giving this opportunity to be, to be on this platform for inviting us and to share our views. Thank you very much once again to all uh, important office bearers of POJS. Thank you. Over to you, Prakash. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sundar and Ashwini, thank you very much for excellent uh, moderation and a good discussion. Thank you to all panelists. And coming to the vote of thanks, it is great pleasure that we have crossed more than 700 delegates. And to the add in the feather in our cap, there are international delegates are also. They are from the Southampton, London, Germany, Prague, Malaysia, Mongolia, and they express their gratitude for all goodness they have learned. And different parts of the India also part more delegates came from different parts of the. India. So all the delegates have made this webinar successful. I thanks Dr. Sonal Panchal, madam, for her valuable time for giving us excellent lecture. I thanks to uh, ICOG chairperson, Dr. Mandakini Meg, madam, and secretary, our friend, Dr. Parag Biniwale, for our giving us one credit point. And I thanks to uh, our conference, our conference. Uh, the media partner and uh, the webinar who has conducted the webinar. I thanks to all the uh, participants as well as the uh, de delegates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mamda, thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.